Recording in progress. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the December 5th, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Koenig. Here. Cummings. Here. Hernandez. Present. McPherson. Here. And Friend. Here. We're going to begin with a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. Um, I'd like to ensure that at least part of our moment of silence is, is dedicated to Roland or Reb Rebley, who uh, quite frankly, left one of the greatest impressions and legacies in our community of anybody that's ever lived within our area and touched so many of our lives in nothing but positive ways, um, not just during his life, but I'm sure for future generations as well. Um, are there others that would like to dedicate the moment of silence for additional comments? So Supervisor McPherson, then Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, in, in my first life in the newspaper business, and that's where Roland Reverly really uh, made his way uh, with weeklies throughout the nation. Uh, he was recognized uh, in the community, as you had mentioned, for so many things, and uh, what what a giving person he he was. Um, but in the in the newspaper business, he was also uh, recognized highly uh, for his stead, steadfast, uh, shall we say, uh, pushing of issues to make him make people live a better life. And he did that so many in so many ways in uh, Santa Cruz County, but in the newspaper profession, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's diminished a little here in the recent years, of course, with what we have, but Roland Reveille made the best of everything. And he was known as a, uh, for a leader in the First Amendment Coalition, always wanted people to speak out, to, you know, and we can, we can reach agreement and consensus if we talk to each other. We have our opinions, and he had many of them, but boy, they were well-founded. And he was just a tremendous person, a great friend. Uh, we're going to miss him. Uh, Santa Cruz County has really been blessed to have Roman Reveille in its, uh, in its county for the last several years. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, just a few more memories I wanted to share about Reb. Um, I had the honor of working uh, with Reb on a campaign, and even in his 90s, um, Reb living in Dominican Oaks just managed to organize and whip up his entire community to get engaged on this important issue. Uh, then, of course, when the Watsonville Hospital was facing bankruptcy, uh, I reached out to Rab, and uh, he wanted to he wanted to get involved, but he wanted to kick the tires a little bit, um, and so he asked to um, set up a meeting with the senior leadership down there at Watsonville Hospital, and uh, we went down there, and he grilled them. Uh, you know, he asked them all the hard questions. Um, they they answered, they, they gave satisfying answers, and I know he was ultimately convinced that. Um, the sort of homegrown talent that care so much about that hospital were worth investing in. It was a good investment for our community. And uh, he gave over a million dollars of his own money, uh, him and his and Pat's money to that effort. And then finally, uh, just this past year, when my daughter was being born, we were in the labor and delivery unit at Dominican Hospital. And there's a nice courtyard in there. And I went outside to sit on a bench and breathe some fresh air. And, and sure enough, uh, it was donated by Pat and uh, Roland Rebley. So look around a little and uh, you'll see the influence of this great man in every part of our community. We'll miss you, Reb. Thank you. If we could have a moment of silence and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Yes, uh, Chair Panda, members of the board, we have one correction. This is on the consent agenda. Item number 35, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 408, which has replaced the financial impact paragraph two should read a multi-year expenditure agreement with Ecology Action contract number 24H37056 
in the amount of $1,591,130 is budgeted under the account 362800 forward slash 632381 forward slash H34100 with projected spending in FY2324 in the amount of $397.794. $794 and subsequent annual spending projected at approximately $397,778. That concludes our corrections. Thank you, Mr. Blasio. So are there any board members like to pull an item from the consent of the regular agenda? I'm seeing none. Uh, we're going to open it up now for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to either address us on items that are not on today's agenda, uh, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors that are on the consent of the regular agenda if you're unable to stay. Good morning. Welcome back. Yeah, good morning. It's December 5th, 2023. My name is James Ewing Whitman. You know, although I really do appreciate the kind hearted words that many of you talk about, um, it's, you know, kind of with politicians don't wash their mouths, wash their hands. You guys literally have generations of criminals that are supporting the bullshit genocide and murder that you guys are promoting. Now, I would like to pull off the, on the consent agenda item, item number 29, which has to do with the reappointment of Mr. Jason Heath. Now, what is going on in this county that seems to be completely beguiling to most of the citizens? It might be as easy to explain why am I not standing for a Pledge of Allegiance to a corporate maritime flag? Why is it that outside these buildings <clears throat> you have California and U.S. flags without the gold pirate fringe on it? You guys are operating on so many different levels of different laws that are not for the health of the community. I think very few people understand what it the, what it means to be a charter city or county. You men were elected, whether that was done fictitiously or not, that's not the question. But under charter cities, you guys are under the control of an internationally controlled regulatory commission that was not elected, it was chosen. And when one looks at various people like Dr. David Martin and what he's done to expose the world homicide, organization, the WHO, more than 110 years ago, you guys are promoting the genocide of the citizens. And it's not just with the frequencies, it's not just with the poison water, but it's with these shots. And so, yes, I would like to pull off the consent agenda item number 29. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, my name is Megan Carroll, and I am the volunteer coordinator at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. And I'm here today because you have three representatives who sit on our JPA board, Emily Chung, Nicole Coburn, and Chief Deputy Chris Clark. We are facing an urgent crisis at the shelter that has been blamed in the media on animal overpopulation, but is really about internal disarray and lack of oversight. We have had a 22% increase in animals from last year to this year, and we are hitting a critical point, the highest level of animals in 10 years. This is a fact, but it is not the reason for our shelter's dysfunction. We are understaffed, there's a lack of resources, and a management vacuum that is leading us towards a cliff. This affects the Santa Cruz community because it impacts the level of care we are able to give the animals and the public who visit our shelter every day. In the very near future, near future these problems will, com will compound and create larger issues in involving public health, public safety, and also affect family-owned pets. We ask that you check in with your representatives on our JPA board as to what is going on at our shelter and to hold management accountable for the ongoing issues that we are facing. The Santa Cruz community needs a well-run shelter that they can be proud of. We bring this to your attention in order to ensure that the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter can continue to support our community animals at the highest level in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Um, good morning, Bill Board. Good morning, Chair Friend. My name is David Brody. I'm the Executive Director at First Five Santa Cruz County. And I'm here to thank you uh, and Supervisor Friend for proclaiming January 2024 to be the 12th Annual Positive Parenting Awareness Month in our county. Um, as many of you know, Positive Parenting Awareness Month started right here in Santa Cruz County some 11 years ago. And since then, it has been replicated and spread all over the state. 
The growing movement recognizes that positive parenting is a powerful predictor of future social, emotional, and physical health, acting as a protective factor, helping prevent and heal adverse childhood experiences. Last year, I reported to you that the importance of positive parenting had been reinforced by the release of a request for applications for parent and caregiver support programs from the California Department of Healthcare Services and their Children, Youth, and Behavioral Health Initiative, which named Triple P as one of four evidence-based programs that the initiative would fund. I am happy to report to you today that we applied for five under that RFA, and our application was fully funded for $400,000 over two years to improve equitable access of Triple P services in our county. At First Five Santa Cruz County, we are proud to manage the Triple P program in partnership with your self-services agency, your human services department, your probation department, and many other community partners and agencies. It is a program that has served over 50, nearly 50,000 parents, caregivers, children, and youth in our county since 2010. Combined with other parenting programs, as well as the family of home visiting that this county helps support through the Thrive by Five initiative, we continue to build a comprehensive system of care that helps reduce the stigma for parents and caregivers to ask for support that they need and provide support that is built around the express needs of those parents and caregivers. We are grateful to this community and I am grateful to each of you, to this board, for your commitment to the children and families of Santa Cruz County and for declaring January 2024 Positive Parenting Awareness Month. Thank you very much. Mr. Barney, thank you for your work. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Christopher Wheeler. I'm here with my wife, Sarah Claus, uh, to address a somewhat more limited uh, scope issue. So we're in a dispute with a neighbor um, on an, an easement issue. It's been in which has been in the courts. Uh, the court case is references B204587. Um, we have been pursuing building permits on that uh, land that we own that is served by the easement. Our, our uh, opponent slash neighbor doesn't think there should be an easement. Um, about two years into the discovery process, um, our neighbor attempted to use SB 13 to permit an accessory dwelling unit to make the easement uh, essentially fire non-compliant. So what I'm looking for is advice, guidance, uh, an opinion on whether SB 13 can be used in the process of a court proceeding to essentially negate a legal easement. The, the easement was upheld in court and is now in appeal, but we feel very confident that we'll win. So if we could get your input on that at any point, we would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Kyle Samuels and I'm here to discuss uh, the possible deferral by the county of SB 43, which is a mental health bill, which would expand the LPS conservatorship to um, people who suffer from drug addiction and other things like that. Uh, the delay could go up for two years, and then you have to implement it one way or the other. Um, my question is, is, is you know, why they th believe the cost is going to be so exorbitant when uh, Section 7 of the code actually uh, requires uh, state reimbursement of funds. Um, for any mandated costs under the legislation. Also, uh, the curse will be mitigating costs uh, in the sense that uh, anybody who's not jailed or um, has to go, like my son has repeatedly gone and been um, put into a hospital because he's been abused or attacked or hurt. And that's those costs are quite exorbitant. But Almost all the costs that would be incurred under the LPS conservatorship is borne by SSI and by Medi-Cal. So I'm not sure what the um, cost would be to the county itself directly. Um, I'm not sure where they come up with this huge uh, exorbitant cost uh, related to possibly implementation of it or administration of it. Um, that still seems quite exorbitant. Uh, my son's been conserved twice by the county and um, he was uh, they attacked somebody in um, one of the facilities and they put him back in jail because he had attacked somebody because he's mentally ill. And they took him off of LPS conservatorship at that point, which seemed quite ridiculous to me at that. You know, why would you say someone who's obviously mentally ill, take him out of a facility and then say, decide he's not uh, no longer LPS conservatorship. 
But now the only avenue for us is SB uh, 43, which is supposed to be implemented starting May 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Preciado, and I hope that the board members uh, read our letter to you about SB 43. I would just say that um, my son is now in jail, and he's been in and out of jail. I'm I'm Kyle's wife. We're talking about the same guy. Um, for um, most of the time in the last two or three years, and um, he doesn't get the proper med sometimes, he's delusional sometimes, he's self-harmed sometimes, he's undergone um, suicide attempts, and there's a real need for SB 43 to be implemented, um, and I urge you to implement it without delay. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, welcome back. Good morning. My name is David Schwartz. I'm a candidate for SAC's position in the upcoming election. I sent the board an email yesterday, fairly comprehensive. I hope you all received it. Many of my comments on the consent items were uh, just questions that I have uh, that could be answered by staff or anybody else by email or what have you. Um, I just would like item 14 removed from the consent agenda because I'd like to know what those claims are and um, how they came to be. Uh, there's a few little things that I'd like to mention about um, uh, for instance, the, the agenda change this morning, it, it's difficult for people to keep up with everything. And I was wondering if there's some way that people can sign up for advanced copy of things so that we're prepared for meetings like this. Um, if there's a change to the agenda, I know that we can go look up online, but you know, when you're in an hour of traffic coming here, it's hard to get that information. Um, I also noticed that in a previous meeting, there was a mention of closed captioning, and I believe we use Zoom for our meetings. Um, Zoom actually does have closed captioning as part of the package, so it may be possible that you guys can uh, initiate that or staff can initiate that, and we can have that, because I, I think it's important that all citizens, whether they're hearing impaired or have other disabilities, are able to contribute. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Cristal Gonzalez, and I'm the Semitas Director at Ventures. Ventures is a nonprofit implementing transformational programs that ensure a shared and prosperous econ economic future for all. We are very grateful for the county support of Semitas. Semitas opens a children's savings account for all babies that were born in Santa Cruz County. Currently, there are over 6,500 babies in Santa Cruz County with a children's savings account. Recently, we completed a survey with our families, and we found that 67% of our families aspire their children to complete at least a master's degree. This is about a 10% increase since 2020. Thanks to the support of our partners, including the county, we are able to offer up to $500 in milestones by the time the child turns five. One of our partners is First Five of Santa Cruz, Baby Gateway and Triple P programs. The Triple P program aligns with one of our goals at Semitas to improve early childhood development. Research has shown that children's savings account have a positive impact on children's social emotional development. Families that attend Triple P classes and have Semitas get a $50 milestone deposit into their account. As January approaches and is declared Positive Parenting Awareness Month, we want to thank you for raising awareness of the importance of positive parenting and recognizing that healthy and happy families will lead to resilient communities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Been here before. Those of you who know how happy I am that policy came to be a youth commission starting coming up thanks to our CEO. That's the best news I've had. If you remember back in 75, the county had one for six years. I'm not in two minutes going to go into all of this stuff I have with me. But I want to say that between now and next year, we can do something different. If you take a look downstairs, at one time that space had a restaurant right in this building. On that possibility and I'm in two minutes I'm going to try to do my best to send an email to you who are supervisors and that we create what here 
you know, the invitation over a long period of time. I don't believe it shows up. Yeah, it does. This is your invitation, a design for youth development policy in California. Let's make it here in Santa Cruz. I was there at Twin Lakes when they announced how much money one church, faith-based, Twin Lakes, right by Cabrillo. I asked somebody in the room who's here for your tax of a half a cent, how much money do you think they announced that at Thanksgiving they had a check for the food bank? Think, what would you answer? How would you say how much money that one church raised? It's over a half a million dollars. You didn't see it in the Sentinel. You got it right here. I am that I am a community organizer. I want to say thank you to those that have relationships. I'm looking for somebody much younger than me at 86. But if we honor Dolores Huerta, just think what Filippi could do to that relationship that he has. So if we take on later, uh, two minutes over. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, thank you for the hard work of the, the commission. Thank you. That's my message. Hello, my name is Lodmila Vojka, and this is a decade like I'm coming here and ask for help, and I still did not get help. I sent you a message again yesterday, and everybody's email on that message, personal email, not just board of supervisors, main mail. And I asked you again for help to my daughter to have assigned professional mental health client service because she doesn't have one. For that decade, she was kidnapped. She was locked up in psychiatric facility to destroy her, to degrade her. And the behavioral health division is succeeded with that. They degraded my daughter. And now they thrown her on my shoulders to take care of her, which is very difficult without a professional help. I need a professional help. If anyone decent, honest, employee, mental health client service specialist, insist in this county because I don't see one. And I was assigned supervisor Robert Annan to contact him. I contacted him initially. He never returned my calls. His supervisor, Karen Kern, never returned my calls. I just had a phone conversation with Tiffany Kendrell Warren, who is also empty suit, the same like Eric Riera was. And she does not even read my emails. I hope you will do or you already did. So it is very serious. And my last call to sheriff department to come over with mental health worker to do welfare check on my daughter, they refused again on December 3rd. That happened again, again, and again. They refused to take an appropriate action and help. So please respond. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Bruce Holloway. I live in Boulder Creek. Um, there's an election coming up, as you all know, and I've been trying to get uh, various kinds of information off of uh, the elections department website. Uh, I usually access it by typing votescount.com. Um, there's a, if you look down the, the page, there's a place to uh, click and put in your address and find out who your incumbents are. And uh, I did that yesterday. And uh, there's a number of retired judges there. It's got Judge Gallagher, Judge Burdick, Judge Salazar. Uh, also, it, uh, it told me uh, the late Judge Maragonda, who passed away about a year ago. Um, then uh, for uh, my local water district, it has the names of six people when I know there's only five members of the board. Uh, my rec district, it says there are five members, but I know that there are really only four because one of those seats is vacant. I've been uh, exchanging emails with the county clerk for over a year about some of these issues, and I've come to the conclusion that there's some sort of a communication breakdown between the elections department and, and the uh, information technology department. 
I don't know if IT is its own department or if it's under general services. I don't know who's in charge, but I think with an election coming up, you ought to be able to make sure that uh, votescount.com is up to date. Uh, and I think there ought to be a 24 hour turnaround. If somebody finds an error, I don't think it should take more than 24 hours to fix it. So one more thing that I forgot to say, I've been looking for information about measure G. Uh, it used to be, there was a complete set of, uh, all the voter information materials, uh, that seems to have disappeared. And that was only five years ago. So I think that should be restored. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Jeff Finsan. Uh, four years ago, I was a hemp farmer down near Watsonville. Uh, my crop was raided uh, three and a half years ago. I have a case against you, so I don't even know if it's appropriate to speak. But you guys go into closed session to decide what my award should be. Uh, my crop was worth several million dollars when it was raided by your sheriffs. And uh, we've settled uh, tentatively for much less. Uh, that's not really a fair settlement. After I pay my attorneys and my taxes, I barely get my expenses out of this. I uh, was the hemp crops are legal. It's not THC. It's medicinal CBD. Uh, I was off to a good business start, and uh, my family has suffered uh, because of your uh, sheriffs uh, erroneously raiding my crops. So please, when you do see my case, I uh, just wanted to introduce myself and let you know who I am. I've been in this county since 1980. I've went to UCSC, Todd Cabrillo. My son was born here. I've started several businesses here. And this was another one that was uh, going to take off and succeed. And uh, your sheriffs, although they, there's body cam footage of them at my site debating if it's legal or not. And they went ahead and destroyed my entire crop. Uh, so please consider that when you look at the, the case. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I live in rural Aptost and I just want to um, say that I support um, Tony Council upholding the rights of this man. And I hope that you will uh, take proper action to defend his rights as a farmer. Um, and I see, congratulations, Mr. Heath, in item, consent item 29, you're being reappointed for another four years. Um, I would like to speak to consent agenda item 34, uh, authorization to seek um, a vendor to provide bottled water for the county in, in times of drought. It is poignant because... Um, this, uh, on December 15th, the S Central Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board will likely approve a permit for the Soquel Creek Water District to inject the treated sewage water that is not distilled water from the Pure Water Soquel Project as it's being um, reported to be during tours. It uh, has a lot of nitrate in it. It was reduced from 3.5 milligrams per liter to 1.67 milligrams per liter, but it still has nitrate. The ambient nitrate of the area where it will be injected is a 0 0.06 milligrams per liter. What else is going to get through? <laughs> if, if the uh, purification can't get out the nitrate and it will have very, very high chlorine also being injected, what else is going to be in there? We may need bottled water because of that. I would also like to quickly say that I uh, am opposed to item 39, CSA 9E increase, because there is no analysis of special or proportional use benefit that Thank will you. go out. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Saying none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes. <laughs> Rachel, your microphone's now available. Thank you so much. Um, there is so much happening today. I've been, I, I don't know where to begin. I've been before you before and suggested that the county supervisors and their staff to vote some attention to considering establishing 
truth commissions regarding every aspect of the COVID era. These might be conceived as uh, teach-ins. They could draw on the strength of the community and they would not require an expensive consulting service. I, I want to speak to you as, as persons who, you know, with families who I'm sure at some level are aware that the crisis of uh, legitimacy is breaking out at this time. Uh, so much is happening today, right now. Um, just yesterday or two days ago, uh, the esteemed uh, international scientist spoke before a parliamentary committee about all aspects of um, the, the vaccine and the, the terrible crisis with uh, excess mortality. There has been a whistleblower in New Zealand who has released the anonymized, anonymized data that has been hidden. And um, uh, scientists from around the world are confirming that there are similarities in the situation throughout the world. And it, this shows definitively, as I have read, that um, the COVID vaccine is the cause of widespread excess mortality. Ken Paxson, the AG for Texas, is suing Pfizer for misrepresentation. Rand Paul, Senator, is leading the charge against fraud. At the same time, um, there is massive censorship. It's a crime now in Germany to speak against public health measures. Matt Taibbi and Matt Michael Schellenberger testified before Congress about the collaboration between the federal government and the tech committees to censor us. So we need you to stand up and to help get the truth out. Please, please stand up. Thank you. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, we are living in a destructive, dictatorial, toxic, military, industrial, media, big pharma, you just heard an example, complex with their manipulative, deceptive propaganda, i.e. lies, and collusion of elected officials, profiting global corporations are destroying the planet. Here's one example. We all see these speed signs that tell us how fast we're going, utterly unnecessary. These are harmful radar speed limits signs and you first approved this they're now all over the county on let's say december 8 2015 uh giving the bid to saint francis electric llc and this is part of the ATP active transportation program that is item 35 today and I submitted documents uh, that you probably shredded and I wrote include these materials in opposition to a so-called school zone safety practice safety project stop study the facts do no harm education not radiation contamination from radar feedback signs or any other microwave emitting technologies these should be removed i submitted documents including the amended declaration of barry trower microwave radiation weaponry expert and he states in conclusion and i'd like to finish this sentence even so-called low levels of microwave radiation are very serious it is impossible to microwave irradiate the body without thank an you, effect Ms. Garrett. thank you we have no further speakers share thank you madam clerk we'll bring it back to the board for comments <laughs> on consent supervisor mcpherson yeah, I have um, some uplifting news to uh, report from my recent, um, we had the annual conference of the California State Association of Counties, or CSAC, and Santa Cruz County was highly recognized for some accomplishments that uh, few counties uh, and their the membership of um, the staff and members of the board uh, received. Um, one of them was to our county uh, supervisor chairman, uh, Zach Friend, 
for um, these uh, receiving the Circle of Service Award uh, to recognize county officials for the advancement of uh, some very uh, above and beyond the norm of what they have done. Uh, he, uh, Zach Friend, is chairman of the uh, CSACs, the California State Association of Counties uh, Human Health and Human Services Policy Committee. And he was recognized on behalf of advocating on behalf of CSAC for all 58 counties uh, for his testimony on the Mental Health Services Act and other mental health initiatives. Um, likewise, uh, this is not CSAC, but uh, NACO, the National Association of Counties. Uh, we, we've known, we've reported on what uh, Supervisor Friend did through years of trips back to D.C. and everywhere else to get the adequate funding to improve the Pajaro River levee. So it was really his steadfast uh, advocacy for this and determination that really made this become a reality. And I think he should be recognized for that. But getting back to CSAC, we had another award that uh, Dr. Ratner was recognized for. He is the uh, Health for, uh, Home, Home for Health uh, Services Division the director. Dr. Ratner uh, re really is uh, was recognized for his uh, addressing homelessness effectively and equitably. Uh, he led the county's housing for health division as it makes some meaningful progress to address homelessness, which is a huge problem, as we all know. But I think uh, the people of Santa Cruz County should know that Santa Cruz County has some terrific leaders uh, and Zach Friend, our supervisor chairman, and Dr. Ratner, and uh, is recognized countywide of all 58 counties. And likewise, uh, there's a, a CSAC Challenge Awards. Um, there was uh, 389 entries of these, and only of the 58 counties, only 10 received uh, recognition. And the one that Santa Cruz County received was for the collective of results and evidence-based investments, or CORE, and how we, we uh, put that program into place to give funding of just over $5 million to various nonprofit agencies in Santa Cruz County. Uh, this is recognized throughout the state of California as a very effective and, and really meaningful program. And I think the people of Santa Cruz County should know that uh, Santa Cruz County is a leader in a lot of these because of the people we have that are running our county, that are serving you in the county, and the programs that we instill in the county. I think it's, we should recognize that. Um, these are very prestigious awards, and uh, I just want to congratulate everybody who is part of making that become a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations on that recognition. Uh, on item 38, adopting a resolution deferring implementation of SB 43, um, which expands the criteria for grave disability, I just wanted to suggest some additional direction. I'm optimistic that this new state law will be helpful uh, in addressing the unmet needs of unhoused individuals who suffer from serious mental health and severe substance use uh, disorders. Um, and I also recognize that it's going to take a substantial amount of public resources to stand up this program. Um, in Santa Clara County considered how to implement this, um, they looked at some language that I, that I want to introduce here as uh, part of the additional direction, which is that we will implement this program no later, no later than January 1st, 2026, and no later than January 2025, receive a report and also quarterly thereafter status updates on each area necessary for for implementation, including treatment and facility expansion, workforce development, and funding. So in, in summary, rather than saying we're going to wait uh, till the you know, final deadline, look at any way we can possibly implement the program sooner and just keep tabs on how we're doing as far as having the resources in place to actually implement it. I know this program uh, is important to our entire community, um, including many of our city partners who struggle with this issue. And I think this just shows our commitment to do everything possible to implement the program as soon as we're ready. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Thank you, Chad. Um, I had a couple um, questions on a number of items. Um, the first I just wanted to highlight uh, were the minutes from the last meeting in particular on uh, the item related to the housing element. Uh, when I was reviewing uh, the minutes, one of the things that I noticed was that 
Um, the additional direction that was provided by Supervisor Friend wasn't actually um, listed because the additional direction Supervisor Friend provided was on par three. Um, not, and, but what's listed is that the additional direction was on the replacement housing, and the inclusional affordable housing. Um, the additional direction related to the inclusionary housing was the direction that I provided. And also within that language, um, it um, was implied or, or uh, the intent was that it was for on-site inclusionary affordable housing and rental units at 15%. Um, and so just for clarity, I wanted to see if we could um, have the minutes reflect the action that was taken because I think it's important for the community to know what the additional direction was that was provided by Supervisor Friend and then a clarification on the, the additional direction that I provided. So I think the most appropriate thing to do would be to not vote on those minutes today and instead uh, move those to the next meeting okay. uh, for consideration. It'll give the, the clerk a chance to review uh, the tape and uh, and clarify and, and get those minutes correct. Great. Thank you. So I guess then do we need to pull that item or just take no action on that? You would take no action on it. The maker of the motion uh, would, would, would indicate that um, they are adopting the consent agenda without that specific item on the minutes. Okay. Um, and, and so just to clarify again, what was missing was the direction provided by supervisor and friend, um, the friendly amendment that was the, what I provided and that within that friendly amendment was the requirement for on-site inclusionary affordable housing in rental units at 15%, which is the same as measured and the rest of the language is the same. It's just the on-site that was missing. Um, thank you for that. Um, the next, I'd add a question on item number 19. Um, I just wanted to see if, and this is related to um, tenant interest on security deposits. And so I'm just wondering if somebody um, from staff might be able to just speak to how that's calculated, because looking at the national average, it's the national uh, interest rate is at 0.61%. And you know, my hope is that we can maximize, um, you know, how much tenants are getting when their security deposits are being held by their landlords. And so I'm just wondering if someone could just speak to how this is calculated and, and the differences that we're seeing here. Good morning, Edith Driscoll, your auditor, controller, treasurer, tax collector. At the request of the board um, 20, 30 years ago, we were asked to annually survey local banks, local major banks, and determine what their interest rate is for passbook accounts, meaning under $5,000, a simple savings account. And we do that annually. On November 2nd, we contacted six local banks, um, BMO, Chase, B of A, Wells Fargo, U.S. Bank, and Commerce Bank, Commercial Bank. And uh, their readings were 0 .01, 0 .01, 0 .01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0.01, 0.01, 0.01 for an average of 0 0.03. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'll just follow up at some point because I'd like to learn more if there's a way. I mean, if this decision was made 30 years ago, is there a way for us to kind of update how this is calculated? But I appreciate it. And just for your information, we recently requested from the clerk of the board that original resolution to determine why we're doing this and uh, what might be changed. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the next item, item number 26, which is the Highway 9 parking. Um, this was a, a tough one, but I think uh, Supervisor McPherson for bringing this forward because um, it's going to kind of restrict some of the parking that's on a small stretch of Highway 9 leading from the city um, where there's been problematic activities um, leading to environmental degradation and there's been some criminal activity within the area. And so my hope is that this can, you know, help deter some of that behavior, but I do hope we can follow up with the city so that we can, you know, figure out how we can activate that area in such a way that we can get people moving around in there that will deter some of that negative behavior. And so I just want to thank Supervisor McPherson for inviting me to sign on to this one. Um, and then as it relates to uh, SB 43, um, I actually had some similar concerns with this one uh, because, you know, this is going to be a huge lift for the county. I, I don't think folks really understand that by, you know, having to have a locked facility specifically for people with mental health issues is not the same as, you know, having a jail. It's not just putting locks on doors. There's a lot of requirements at the state level to make some of these things happen. So I just wanted to see if maybe someone from staff could speak to you. There's a mention of a $20 million amount that we need to, you know, put up up front to cover staffing costs. But I'm just wondering, in addition to that, you know, if, if somebody could speak to you, how much the facilities are going to cost or have we worked that out? And also how much um, 
it's going to cost for outpatient because when people get released, they don't necessarily have a family to go back to. And we don't want people slipping back into, you know, having addiction problems or going into homelessness. So I'm wondering if there might be someone here who could speak to that item. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Cummings and board. I'm Randy Morris, the Human Services Director um, and Human Services and Health Services. Um, Monica will speak for herself, both co-signed the letter. So I'll start. The costs that are referenced was referenced in public comment. Um, the reason I'm here is the Public Conservator Office is held within Human Services in one of my divisions. So that's why we're one of the co-authors of this. Um, there are a substantial amount of costs that would need to be incurred that are not leveraging federal and state dollars to expand the public conservator's office. On top of that, the public defender's office to represent clients in court. On top of that, county council to represent us in court. And then Monica can speak for her staff, but there are behavioral health staff who do evaluations. Most of that is county general fund with a little bit of leveraging. And all of that is cost that is not funded through this legislation. It was mentioned in public comment that you can sort of put a claim forward to incur those costs, but those take years and it's unclear whether the state's gonna fund that. That is state law that is not changed in SB 43. We are responsible to go through due process under the current law, which requires a heavy amount of county staff time to sort of go through that process to bring petitions forward. As to the cost of care, uh, conservatorship is a means to an end. It asks people to have their civil liberties suspended to involuntary forced treatment upon them, but that assumes there is treatment. There is also no new treatment funded in this legislation, which is where health comes in because our conservatorship office files the petition. If somebody's conserved, then we under court order refer them to services, yet there's no funding for services, which is where the healthcare agency comes in, which Monica could speak to. Good morning, board. Monica Morales, Health Services Agency Director uh, for the county. Um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. And so one of the things that we're talking about is in the county, we have about 90 to 100 different uh, beds for residential treatment. However, um, we actually compete with the private sector for them. So that's in total what you see in the county. So that's something for us to take into account. Um, as we were studying the data, we recognized that potentially about a quarter of the population that will qualify for grave disability uh, will also have a substance use and addiction issue. What that means for us is that we have to think about two things. We have to think about the criteria for residential right and um, involuntary placement for grave disability. But then you have the substance use and addiction issue, which is different. And this is something for us to keep in mind. When you place someone in care for a mental health issue, it's a different type of residential formula in management than if you have someone also with a SUDS issue. In our county right now, unfortunately, we still work under silos. We don't have programs, systems in place that can address both the mental health of grave disability and the SUDS condition. You actually need to have clinical certification, clinical background to manage the actual treatment for folks to be able to safely detox. For example, we don't have those facilities in the county. So that's why, although some of this is reimbursable, the uptake to build these facilities in the county is really a cost that we don't have any funding for. Typically in behavioral health, uh, about 90 you know, of, of our funding, very high amount comes from state dollars, federal dollars, or the reimbursement. So we wouldn't have the general fund available right now uh, to just start these programs. And so that's what we're asking for you to let us think about really what it's going to take, continue to do the assessment on what we need in terms of residential and what we have, how Care Corps will actually help us get closer to our goal and then be able to come back and put these in place where it makes sense that we have the capacity both in terms of um, facilities but also the expertise to do to manage both issues and if i may approximately 70 percent of the currently conserved clients are already placed out of county so i just it would expand and if it's appropriate to make a brief comment since it's our staff memo uh, this is referencing supervisor koenig's uh, recommendation for additional direction 
we recommend it if you approve that we come back in a year. And I don't see any reason why at that one year mark, you can direct us to come back quarterly. I'm, I'm not sure why now. The reason is the landscape is changing tremendously in this next year. And none of us have any idea what's going to happen when we come forward in that next year. There might be funding. There might be a class action lawsuit. I would humbly recommend you consider you have full authority to direct us to do anything at that one year report. Um, it's just a lot of staff time spent not implementing and finding funding, writing reports. We, you can give us that direction in a year if you'd consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have other questions? No, that's that's it for now. I think you okay. touched on the questions I wanted to ask. And so, I mean, I'm, I was actually gonna make some suggestions around kind of report backs and, and, um, and I understand the urgency with trying to get this move forward, but I do also respect um, what staff has just brought up is that if they're constantly working on reports, they're not actually out there trying to get the grants and the funding that we need. So I would feel comfortable um, coming back in a year to get a full report. Would also um, suggest that maybe during the budget um, hearings this year, we kind of see what funding is being set aside to implement this and make this happen at the county level so that we're tracking the funding that's going to be going into making this um, program or standing up this program. So that's, that, those are all my comments for now. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Anything to add? Uh, just really briefly, you know, uh, I'm really uh, excited that we got an agreement for funding between the Caltrans uh, and Health Services for Active Transportation. You know, I think it's uh, important to improve our bike and pedestrian uh, infrastructure throughout the county. We just recently last weekend had another pedestrian fatality in Watsonville in the exact same location that we had one about three months ago. So, you know, there's a, certainly a need. And so I'm, I'm really uh, thankful for this, for these funds that we're getting in. Certainly, uh, I think that there is a health crisis of bike and pedestrian fatalities and injuries in our county, uh, especially in the fourth district. So really excited about that. The other two, I just had really brief questions and comments. Uh, I, I thought I had, uh, I have one commissioner, but I've had I was supposed to have two commissioners that were supposed to be on the consent agenda. I just noticed now that there's one. And then the other one is, um, with the, there were some comments about, in the public comment about the uh, Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter JPA. Um, but, you know, I, th I think, I knew that we had a relationship, but it'd be good if we can get um, kind of more um, input on these JPAs that we're involved in, especially ones that we're the lead agency in. Uh, to get more uh, information on these on these agencies that we're involved with, uh, to get uh, more clarification when things like this come up. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Um, just as a point of clarification, is that just something that you're looking to have a, a meeting with the CAO to, to understand, get a better understanding, or what is there some specific direction on that? Yeah, meeting or some sort of re written report for us, especially. Uh, new supervisors, right? That okay. we might not be aware of GPAs that we're the lead agency on that we might get approached on. Totally fair. I mean, I'll, I'll defer then to the CAO to work with you on that. Um, I'll just speak very briefly on item 29, which is the reappointment of our county council. Who, uh, it should go without saying that if the board is uh, unanimously seeking to reappoint Mr. Heath, that he's done an outstanding job. It's a very, very, very challenging and complicated role. I don't know that the community understands or can, can understand. Um, the complexity that which your team has to work from natural disasters to day-to-day -day contracts. To, there isn't actually a single item on today's agenda that wasn't reviewed by county council and his team uh, to put into perspective the involvement in all county actions. Um, your team does it very ethically and appropriately and we're, we're very pleased to have you coming back and, and guiding us for the next four years. Um, we'll move it now to the board for a motion, recognizing that there was a little bit of a debate over one of the items, additional direction. Supervisor. I just wanted to make a couple comments on it. The consent agenda. Oh, please. Yeah. Um, I too want to thank, uh, Supervisor Cummings and the Sheriff's Office, uh, County Public Works and Caltrans for their, uh, collaboration in, um, bringing this item forward in on the parking restrictions on Highway 9. Um, also, I wanted to mention, uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, the great work of our county council and his entire staff, Jason Heath, and really pleased that uh, we were able to uh, keep him on board for another four years. I won't see him all probably, but uh, anyway, we sure like, you've been terrific and your whole staff has been too. 
Uh, one other comment on uh, item number 32 on the big basin water loan request update. Um, the turnaround uh, to report back on this item was unusually fast. I know that given the urgency of the situation fe- uh, facing our big basin water community, which is a private entity that serves over 500 uh, connections. So thank you for all the staff and for the work you've been doing uh, up to now. Uh, the county might provide additional assistance giving the loan request by the court appointed receiver, something that I have never experienced on this board uh, in my 11 years. Um, and as we'll hear later today, related to the sales tax measure, as we are likely to hear next week regarding the state of our cash flow too, um, there are very difficult times ahead for the county because uh, of all the services we have provided during the three recent disasters. And, and yet the future of the Big Basin Water Company is really critical issue in my district. And we want to be as helpful as we can. So I look forward to the report back uh, next week, see if there's anything we might do. But uh, things are limited. And as uh, we were talking about these other things about funding and so forth, um, it's very disheartening. The legislative analyst office just gave a, an outlook of this year's uh, fiscal uh, state fiscal uh, picture, uh, they show a $26 billion shortfall this fiscal year and a $58 billion shortfall next fiscal year. So um, it's going to be tougher than ever to get funding from the state sources. Uh, as as darling, we, we need them very seriously, but uh, it's going to be a tough uh, financial picture that we're going to have in this county, as is the state. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll move to a motion, Ms. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I will move that we adopt the consent agenda accepting item 13, the approval of the minutes, and with the additional direction on item 38, that we will defer implementation of SB 43 until no later than January 1st, 2026. And and that uh, there would be some discussion during our uh, next budget hearings about the funds necessary for implementation of that state law. Second. Supervisor Cummings, does that meet your also discussion on that item? I believe so. I believe so. The the item on the implementation, the one um, question I have is, you know, if it seems like we're not going to have funding and there's no funding coming from state, Yes, would we intend on trying to extend that or what? Well, how would we address that issue? Because right now, I think the recommendation is just to defer it until 2026. And if we're intending on implementing in 2026, if I heard that correctly, then I think the landscape is still pretty open in terms of how we're going to pay for this. I think we cross that bridge when we get there and, you know, uh, receive the update and the um, 2025 and throughout the, the time between now and then. I, I guess I'll, I'm supportive of it. I just hope that we're not sending the wrong message to the community that we're going to do something and then turns out we have to circle back on our words. Um, but if this is the direction the board's intending to go in, then I'll be supportive of it. I'm in agreement in, with you, Supervisor Cummings. I, I think at the end of the day, the staff recommendation is fine, actually. It, it brings us back to a report in 2025. There's a goal of 2026, but I think that if we create the expectation and care court ends up costing three, I mean, as somebody who's dealing with this statewide, I can tell you that there's a lot of unknown unknowns in regards to this. And we have a tens of billions of dollars uh, state deficit. So I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the additional direction because I feel like it sets us up for a expectation um, that I don't know that we could meet. I mean, one of it is is that we have an expectation that we want to meet, and I think that that's universal. One of it is the board providing direction that we shall meet it and then having to backtrack on it. So um, I'm not supportive. So this is what I would recommend. Um, if somebody would be willing to move the entirety of consent minus 13, and we'll pull out 38 and vote on it separately so we can come to some resolution. Let's get consent passed. Um, and then uh, we can just figure out how to land on the language on that. I think that, that would be good. Is that Would there be someone willing to introduce a counter motion for consent minus item 13 and 38? And then we're going to come back and have a discussion on 38 a little bit more. I'll move consent agenda. I have the consent agenda and uh, minus 38 and 13. And 13, is there a second? 
Second. Okay, so that's a, that's a counter motion. So we'll vote on the counter motion first. Is there any additional discussion? Can I just clarify who the second was on this counter motion? It was Bruce, uh, excuse me, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Oh, we have to do it. Um, roll call. I'm sorry, because we have that online. If we get a roll call vote, please. Certainly, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that's the understanding that the minutes will come back. I know, Madam Clerk, in the next meeting that are correct, corrected, even yes. though it wasn't specifically stated. And then item uh, 38. So we got to have additional now discussion on 38 if, that, if we're comfortable with that. Um, I mean, we could, there's sort of two motions here. I think one of them is for staff recommendation, one's for additional direction. So I'll leave it to my colleagues to make a motion for their respective worlds, and then we'll, we'll see where three land. I, I can make a motion. So I'll move the staff recommendation. Um, and that with the only additional direction of bringing back um, an update on funding at the budget hearings. So just to clarify, um, you su suggesting that even having language that says we will do we'll implement the program no later than January 1st, 2026, rather than uh, on January 1st, 2026 is, is too great of a promise to our community. I think so. I mean, there's so many uncertainties yeah. with this in terms of how much we're going to be able to bring in funds and we we're trying to go out to get a revenue measure passed right now and so you know i think that we need to you know assure the the people of this community that we're going to be you know putting up standing up programs and bring in funding in appropriate ways and not over promising and i think um saying that we shall implement this in 2026 might be an over promise especially with the fact that staff has indicated that there might be some conflicts at the state level um so we don't really know where this is going but this is a good opportunity for us to start moving in this direction for of implementation and then as we get the updates we'll see how this landscape keeps changing yeah i i agree i think that's good i just don't want to get us in a position like we have been with the homeless problem we make promises and there's no way we can keep them with the funding that we have and so i think it's good to take a pause or take a, a clearer look in the future so thank you well currently there's a motion from supervisor cummings there isn't a second is there a second then supervisor? I'll second. okay uh, is there a counter motion, Supervisor? No. Okay. And then, if we, with no additional discussion, if we could have a roll call on 38, it's a uh, first staff recommendation or recommended actions from Supervisor Cummings, with a second from Supervisor McPherson. And uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't Supervisor, it was Supervisor Hernandez. I apologize. And to clarify, the clerk understands that it's the recommended actions plus additional direction to return at budget hearings with a funding update. That is correct. And I, that I is, misspoke. That's you're correct. And that is budget hearings in this upcoming cycle. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and specifically the 2024, 2025 budget hearings, not the mid year that's going to be coming up in the next couple months. Thank, thank you for, for the that. No, thank you for the clarification. Appreciate Absolutely. that. So we have a motion and a second. If we go to roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? No. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Friend? Aye. And that passes uh, four to one. Thank you, though, for the discussion. I mean, I think it's a good one. Um, we'll now move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is item. Seven, a presentation for the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. That landed memo to CAO. We're very fortunate this morning to be joined by uh, Jim Brown, the Executive Director of the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. Thank you for waiting for this, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Just one moment. You just press the, the button toward the, the middle there, the base, for the microphone, a little higher up. The great button. There we go. Good morning, Chair Friend and uh, supervisors and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to present this arts and economic prosperity study uh, for the County of Santa Cruz. And a huge thank you for, to the county for supporting the creation of this report. For those of you less familiar with the Arts Council, we see ourselves as the mycelial network that keeps the arts ecosystem in our community healthy. For 44 years, we've worked mostly behind the scenes uh, to keep our arts ec ecosystem connected, well-resourced, and vibrant. The primary point of this study is to show that the arts aren't just a nice thing to have. Um, they're not something that, that we, a luxury that we spend money on when we have it and cut when we don't. Uh, the arts are an essential resource that makes our communities more livable, helps define a sense of place, and improves community cohesion. They also generate real economic impact 
this report conceived and managed by Americans for the Arts, which is a nation, a national advocacy organization for the arts, um, is also conducted by 300 communities across the county, including here in, in Santa Cruz by the Arts Council. Mm -hmm. And it seeks to, quant to quantify that economic impact. In the county of Santa Cruz, the nonprofit art sector generates over $68 million in economic activity. This includes direct spending by nonprofit organizations like the Arts Council on things like salaries and supplies, venue rentals, um, and taxes. It also includes, includes spending by audiences. This is spending over and above the ticket price on things like meals out, um, having a drink with a friend before the event, or childcare, travel, a hotel stay. It does not include arts businesses that are for profit, like the Catalyst or the Rio or uh, Artisans Gallery in downtown Santa Cruz. It also does not include spending by school districts on arts education activities. So when you, if you were to do the study that included all of that, the arts sector would be much larger still. All of this economic activity generates 1,437 jobs. These include jobs for artists and arts administrators like myself, as well as jobs at store clerks, babysitters, um, you know, waiters and hoteliers. The study estimates that the arts and culture sector generates $3.5 million in local tax dollars, and that's dollars that go back to governments like this one to invest in a, in a healthy, safe, and vibrant community. Almost $14 million of that $68 million is event-related spending by arts and culture audiences. This spending is over and above the ticket price and helps local businesses thrive. One second. Okay, so uh, last fiscal year, this county invested $240,000 in grants to arts organizations. Um, you also made other investments in the arts through the Percent for the Arts program that I haven't been able to quantify at this point, but I'm working for, with county park staff to do that. Uh, regardless, we think of this investment as seed funding that organizations like the Arts Council and many others use to generate tens of millions of dollars of economic activity. The modest investment that you make is multiplied 283 times based on these numbers. For the first time, we did studies um, for all of Santa Cruz County, the city of Santa Cruz, and the city of Watsonville this year. Uh, the bar on the left shows the total economic impact for the entire county. Um, gray is for, uh, is for organizational spending, and is green is for audience spending. Next to that, you see the city of Santa Cruz, which represents more than 50% of the economic impact generated in the, uh, in the county. Um, on the far right, you see the city of Watsonville generates only 13% of the total economic impact in the county. Um, the remainder of the county is that other column, um, everything that wasn't included in the other uh, studies, and that accounts for about 30%. Uh, the data is somewhat skewed. Uh, this data is uh, organizations like the Arts Council that do services countywide. Our data is counted in the city of Santa Cruz where we're headquartered. But still, the, uh, the, the, um, the message is clear that the more money you invest in a community in the arts, the more money it generates in return. And the city of Watsonville has been a community where less economic investment has been made in the arts. And that's beginning to change. The Arts Council has been making some significant investment in Watsonville. And the Watsonville City Council also passed an ordinance to uh, on private, de uh, private development to invest uh, a percent for the arts ordinance that will invest directly in the arts. And we hope to see these numbers go up at the city of Watsonville. This chart compares Santa Cruz County audience spending, and that's individ the individual audience member, um, versus regions across the, the country with similar populations. You'll notice that Santa Cruz County audience spending is on the low side for the regions shown. And when you consider that we are on the central coast of California, where the cost of living and doing business is so high, these numbers start to look really low. Um, if you, the green is uh, is visitor spending and the gray is local spending. So I think what you'll notice here is that communities like Scottsdale and Monterey very likely have far more hotel stays for their cultural tourists. 
And we see that there's a real opportunity here to partner with my colleague at Santa Cruz County, who'll be presenting that next, to really use cultural tourism to uh, to generate additional hotel stays. So thank you to the County of Santa Cruz for decades of investment in the arts. Uh, with all of the changes underway in our community and with one major funder, the Packard Foundation, dramatically scaling back investment in the arts, um, I encourage you to look for ways to increase investment in the arts to ensure that our community rem remains vibrant, creative, and has that strong sense of place that we have. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Our county is synonymous with the arts and appreciate your work. Other questions or comments from board members? <laughs> Supervisor Hernandez, please. You know, I'm I'm glad all the work you guys are doing, and I just I you know realized the the new facility and the new work that you guys are doing in South County as well, and I got to hear a little bit of the work that that uh, the city of Watsonville is doing. Uh, I've seen that little bar of you know organizations that are doing work, but I think that organization that the black bar that shows organizations doing the work and sort of the generate what's generated on that green portion also has to do with the organization that's getting the funding to yeah. do the work in South County. Absolutely. So I'd like to see, you know, in the future, if we can improve that situation for organizations that are doing um, arts uh, in South County as well. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, participation in the arts really contributes to the well-being of the community as well, you know, beyond the economic factor, uh, beyond the, you know, the vibrancy and the and the creativity. I think there's a sense of well-being that's created in participating in the arts and just being around art too, uh, really cre creates a better sense of well-being, and that's uh, deeply needed in South County as well. So, if there's any way that you know we could look at increasing funding for South County uh, to get some sort of equity in that in that in that um, segment, I greatly want to expand those conversations yeah we've been doing a lot of work to make those changes uh our grant making program has really shifted to try to focus on increased investment in in, in watsonville and south county in particular um, we've also gotten funding from the hewlett foundation who has a strong interest in equity in the arts and uh, and we just got that funding renewed and that uh, is a three hundred thousand dollar investment that we're going to is going to allow us to continue the work that we've been doing for the next couple of years but there is still a lot more work to do and as that uh, as the funding comes in from the city of watsonville for their percent for the arts measure um, and they determine how they're going to make those investments that that should help significantly well, hopefully in the future we can find a way that that the county can participate in i would i would love to see the currently the uh, what what i'm personally hoping is that the uh, the county will follow watsonville's lead and create a developer fee percent for the arts on private development that would allow us to uh, increase investment in the arts across the county and i've been communicating with the arts commission about that thank you thank you the supervisor comments yeah, i was going to um Thank and appreciate all the work that you all do um, as a musician. I, one of the things that has made me feel comfortable in Santa Cruz is just how vibrant this place is in terms of the musician that it attracts and um, the ability for people to just express themselves through the arts, um, whether it's um, auditory, whether it's visual. I know when I was in the city council, we had the sea walls um, murals get implemented in the city and just seeing blank walls around communities and just thinking about how that can be a good space for art. And, you know, in, in the graffiti world, people don't, you know, do graffiti on, on murals. And so just wanting to see us continue to, you know, see how we can make our community a more beautiful place with, with implementing art. And so I'd love to follow up with you on this um, fee for the arts, because I think it could be a great way for us to contribute to those folks in our community. We know artists often struggle to live in our community and with the yep. higher cost of living, like really being able to support artists to stay here, I think is something that we'd all appreciate. And so, yeah, the tannery has been a huge help and the waiting list for housing at the tannery, I believe there's four separate waiting lists with 300 people on each list mm -hmm. and they're always full. Right. So thank you. I'll I'll reach out to you and we'll uh, have a conversation. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. <laughs> sure. So since I was just mentioned, I would uh, encourage that we look at an incentive uh, for arts to be inclu included in new developments rather than a fee. Um, you know, sort of contradictory that we would increase the cost of housing, therefore making it more difficult for more artists to stay here at the same time that we're trying to raise money for the arts. Um, just my take on that. Um, but in general, yeah, I, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I know whenever I travel to any place, whether it's domestically or nationally, one of the first things I do is see what's going on with the arts in that community. 
And we all know, because uh, we live here, just how vibrant Santa Cruz County is as far as an art scene. But I think that uh, as your presentation demonstrates, we can do more uh, to make our arts community more accessible and more of uh, one of the primary reasons that people actually come to visit Santa Cruz and uh, maybe extend their stay in Santa Cruz because there's that many more uh, art exhibits or um, public projects that they want to visit while they're here. Exactly. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. I, too, wanted to just congratulate you for uh, leading the charge on uh, really enhancing our arts community in Santa Cruz County. Um, they were very impressive numbers of $68 million uh, in economic activity and over 1,400 jobs and what $3.5 million in tax revenue. Yeah. And uh, I think that it should be noted, too, that uh, we take it seriously on the Board of Supervisors. Some of our analysts, former analyst uh, Mr. Mulhern, uh, served on the Arts Council for several years. And I, today's analyst, one of my analysts, J.M. Brown, was president for two years and has served on it for five years. So it's... Uh, we really get it. We think it's important to do uh, to really enhance the arts community in Santa Cruz County. I think um, really when we see the overall picture, it's really a very uh, important part of developing a uh, and showcasing Santa Cruz County's positive personality that we have here. And so I want to thank you, Mr. J Jim Brown, not to be <laughs> not Jim. with J.M. Brown, my office. But uh, congratulations on a very successful effort that we've had here in Santa Cruz County. Thank you so much. Thanks for the support. Thank you. This is not an action item, but this is an opportunity for members of the community to speak on this item because it is not on today's agenda. Is there anybody in the chambers that would like to address us? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I also appreciate the public art in our various places and have um, um, supported this board's use of public money in public art, funding it at the new libraries, the Aptos Library, the Live Organics, and um, most recently, the Children's Crisis Center. I would like you to um, check out a funding source that I haven't heard mentioned here, and I believe it is the Monterey Peninsula Economic Partnership it is a huge, uh, these are the folks that put on the uh, Laguna Seca races, the Congors, the Elegans, the Pebble Beach golf tournament. They get a lot of money. And I do know that they give a lot of money back to the community, including Santa Cruz County. The Santa Cruz Fairgrounds Foundation has regularly received large grants from that organization. So please investigate that. What I would like some discussion about is how is it decided where the, this money, these projects are going to be. I'm um, hopeful that there will be an increase in the amount given to South County. And I am happy that the Watsonville City Council is now requiring public art, but I think that um, I would like an explanation of the allocation of the money that you do have and how that can be increased to go to Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from Chambers? Is there anybody, Madam Clerk, online for this item? Yes, Chair. Call and user one. Your microphone is now available. Thank you for the informative presentation. Uh, Supervisor Hernandez earlier commented on uh, tracking the funding, and I recommend reprioritizing county's fund funding. Um, I spoke earlier about the harmful and unnecessary radar speed signs uh, when they were funded in December of uh, 2015. Each sign caused close to $13,000 plus additional costs. This is a squandering of uh, taxpayer money. I'd like more funding allocated for the arts, which also would help the mental health situation. Uh, when people uh, are not in dire poverty and they have arts and music and uh, good jobs, um, they do better. They feel better, of course. 
up, and they're not in desperation. Approximately half of our tax dollars go to the military, and we need, like, food, not bombs, arts, not bombs, musicians and music, not bombs, housing for all, not bombs, employment for all, healthy environment, organic farming. You just spoke of the tannery and the number of people on the waiting list. Our money is going to the wrong places in this country. It needs to go to housing. I'm glad we have some art. We need to reprioritize where our money is going. That's my comment, and thank you again for the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate the presentation. Thanks so much. We'll now move on to item eight, which is a presentation from Visit Santa Cruz County as outlined in the memo of the CAO. And I'll just hand the introduction of this item over to my colleague, um, Supervisor Cummings, because he serves on the board. Yeah, I just want to um, thank the executive director for coming in today. We, when we met earlier this year, um, there was an ex expression uh, by the new executive director to want to connect with um, all the different boards and cities and groups, and I recommended that he come and give a presentation to our board. And so, just happy to see you here today, so we can learn more about your vision of how you're going to lead Santa Cruz, uh, visit Santa Cruz moving forward. So, thank you for joining us. Well, Supervisor Cummings, oh, excuse me, Super, no. Supervisor Cummings, thank you so much for your service to our board, and thank you to this body uh, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for supporting our organization, supporting tourism in our, in our community. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to give you a little background on myself uh, because I've been here for three months now. So I just recently uh, came here, uh, very happy to come here from Lake Havasu City, Arizona, where the low temperature in the summer was 96 degrees. And uh, I would I'd tell you a short story. When I first came here to look for a house, one of the wonderful uh, staff members at the Hyatt Place uh, advised me to be careful because we had an extreme heat warning, and that was 85 degrees. So I thought that was absolutely charming and uh, loved every minute of it. So I have over 24 years of experience in hospitality and tourism. A large part of that is in operations and uh, sales and marketing with uh, branded and independent hotels. And uh, so I, I feel like I have a really good uh, broad-based um, uh, experience for what I'm doing today. Um, one of the things that's always been very important to me, whether I've been with uh, a destination management organization or a hotel, is community engagement. And so as uh, as Supervisor Cummings uh, mentioned, I have been um, out and about meeting everybody that I possibly can and will continue to do that until such time as I feel like I'm really, really um, uh, engaged with the community. Uh, I will say that the community has been super welcoming, and I cannot appreciate that any more uh, than what I'm saying right now. I am very much dedicated to equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. I'm also dedicated to tourism sustainability and housing solutions. And to that extent, I have just been accepted onto the Cal Travel Commissions for these things, uh, for EDIA, uh, sustainability, and homelessness. And so I'm very excited to move forward with them and hopefully bring back some ideas to our uh, county about ways we can move forward. I like how the description up here, I've never seen this before, a person in a suit and tie. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so I just want to let you guys know that I'm, a, I'm new here. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, I am totally uh, engaged with the community or getting engaged with the community. Uh, I want to engage with all of you. Uh, I've spoken to our city councils and uh, engaged as, as best I can with our chambers and our uh, elected bodies. Uh, I've also reached out to our stakeholder businesses, our hotels, our restaurant tours, our attraction operators, and other strategic partners, and had a, a have had a, a fantastic three and a half months getting to know everybody. I will let you know that from a personal perspective and a professional perspective, um, my commitment and my organization's commitment are to all the cities, communities, and unincorporated areas in this county. We are very committed to attracting visitors, domestic and international. And I will tell you that, uh, and I, I keep saying, I hope I never have to say the, the, the year 2019 again, uh, but we are stronger than we were in 2019. We've just made it to that point. Um, and we, we are seeing an uptick in our international travel, which uh, took a real dive uh, after the pandemic. But most importantly, and I want the, I want everybody that, uh, that, uh, all the tourists, all the residents know that the number one customer of our organization at Visit Santa Cruz County 
are the residents of this county and and the businesses in which uh, which operate within our county. So even though it's our job to bring people, uh, bring travelers and visitors and celebrate uh, our county and let everyone know about the world class destination that we have to offer here. At the end of the day, uh, everything we do is to improve the quality of life uh, for our residents. So with this renewed commitment with the county, I just want to continue to let you know that I'll continue to work with you guys uh, as, as, as you see fit. Um, I'm happy to come and talk to you at any time about anything. I know recently you guys had, discovered, uh, had discussed um, the possibility of cannabis, cannabis tourism, so I'd love to be in on that conversation with you guys. Uh, I will provide you with regular updates uh, as you see fit. I will continue to engage with all of our stakeholders and our communities. You'll see me out uh, volunteering for events and uh, even my own organization where we're looking right now to engage in a cleanup day uh, so that we can help uh, make our community a better place to live. And one other thing I wanted to bring up to you guys is uh, one of my goals, <clears throat> excuse me, for 23, 24, <clears throat> excuse me again, is the Santa Cruz County Autism Travel Initiative. Now, this is something that I started uh uh, before I left Lake Havasu City, uh, I'm very keen to bring it here. Uh, I think I have a slide about this. So the Santa Cruz County Autism Travel Initiative is such that my organization before the end of this fiscal year, I hope, uh, will become a certified autism center. What that means is that I am already a certi certified autism travel professional. All of my staff members at, su at such time uh, will engage in a very extensive online training to understand and to recognize and to assist in the case of somebody who is on the spectrum or an autistic person having a meltdown or some sort of issue and to help them and their caregivers in such a case. To that extent, once we are all certified and we become a certified autism center, in our uh, visitor center, current visitor center and hopefully our new visitor center moving forward in the fiscal year 24, uh, we will place a quiet space, a quiet darkened space where those who are on the spectrum and who are having issues can go and rejuvenate and resuscitate themselves and uh, and 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 get to a place where they're comfortable being in public. Uh, once that is yeah. achieved, then I will get with the, this board and I will get with city councils and I will go to the incorporated cities and I will encourage them to become certified autism destinations. What this means very briefly is that a certain small percentage of industries, uh, individuals and companies need to commit to this and at such time, the organization you see there at the bottom, IBCCES, will assist us in helping all of you become certified autism destinations. The ultimate goal is uh, the big aud audacious idea, if you will, is for the county to become a certified autism county slash destination. There aren't many in this country. In fact, I don't think there are any in uh, California. So I would love to lead the way on that. Why is this so important to me? It's because, you know, since I've been here for three and a half months, I have never in my life felt more welcomed, felt more a sense of place and a sense of welcoming than I have in this county. From every single person I've talked to, whether they're individuals, strangers, friends, uh, elected officials, uh, people that own companies, people that work at companies, everyone has been so welcoming. And I understand that uh, it is the nature of this, of this county, and it, to that extent it feeds the values that I have as a person, that we are so welcoming. But at the same time, I don't want us to overlook the fact that there, it isn't just about people of, people of color or people of faith. It's also about people with neurodiversity. And to that extent, I have friends, I have family members, I have friends of family members and former staff uh, members who are on the spectrum. And to this extent, I have talked with a lot of people and got a lot of uh, buy-in from this, from the nonprofit sector and from the profits for profit sector. So I'm very excited to bring this to the county. And to the extent that you guys can support this, I'll engage in greater conversations with you guys on this. Excuse me. I know I only have so much time and Supervisor Cummings knows I can go on and on. Uh, so some recent content, I'll go very quickly through these. I'm not going to go through all these. I did want to let you guys know some of the more recent content we have. So this is for the Watsonville Strawberry Festival. And as you can see, three, 731 plus hours of total playtime. Now, I took this about a month ago, this slide. So those hours have gone up uh, dramatically. Uh, here's another content uh, for Scotts Valley on Facebook. As you can see, uh, we do, di we, in this particular case, we did two different posts, uh, received 2.2 thousand link clicks as of October and had a reach of over 112,000 uh, people. And of course, we featured all those businesses in this post. Uh, more Facebook. Here's a stroll through Capitola Village. 
again, huge numbers, uh, reached over 183,000 accounts and 4,000 uh, link clicks. And then more Facebook. So uh, we don't just obviously cover the cities. We also cover the county. And uh, here, we're, here we're showing uh, some of the beauty in our north coast. And uh, as you can see there at the bottom, some of the uh, entities that we highlighted and over 100, almost 140 impressions. And furthermore, to the county, discover the Santa Cruz Mountains in Felton. Again, 167 impressions. And as you can see there at the bottom, a tremendous amount of uh, businesses and entities uh, portrayed in our Facebook post. And then Instagram, of course, we don't forget Instagram. Right there, a simple best avocado toast from uh, Honey Lux Coffee. Uh, got a huge, uh, huge response. And the same day, we love our agriculture too. So we featured that on Instagram Reel with some really good numbers. Uh, one last thing, we do a blog, uh, and on this particular one, it, it, it piggybacked on a stroll through Capitola Village. And so, as you can see, uh, we featured the uh, world-class views, uh, movies and concerts, and uh, top top 20 patios to dine on in Santa Cruz County. So I want to give you some quick, um, excuse me, tourism market indicators. Uh, this is for October. The numbers are very are very uh, pleasing. 66.4% in hotel occupancy. That's an increase of 6.4% year over year. Our airport airport throughput. Now, this is not direct to Santa Cruz County, but this is the airport throughput through uh, Manetta is up 4.7%. Our hotel revenue is up 2.5% in October to $16.6 .6 million. And then finally, our leisure and hospitality jobs are up 2.1%. That's really good news for us at 14 uh, 1,700 for the month of October. So top of mind in 2024, excuse my voice, I got really dry mouth right now. The most important thing for me right now is to find a new location for our visitor center. Uh, we're looking at that. I did get some cautiously encouraging news from a particular, uh, particular uh, location. So I'll hope to talk to you more about that. We are expanding our international awareness and visitation. We are, of course, going to maximize our drive market visitation from the 300 uh, mile uh, radius that we that we consider. Uh, we want to look at ways of mitigating the effects to tourism of by our extreme winter weather. And even though it's not a part of tourism, it's very important to me personally and professionally uh, that we help uh, our friends in Watsonville and our friends in other areas uh, develop new assets. Uh, such as hotel bills, uh, new attractions, uh, help agriculture uh, uh, do more visitor facing. Uh, uh, efforts. and But as we work on that, with that, you can't do that without looking at workforce and housing too. So uh, I've mentioned this to my board and they're all for uh, me being a part of that conversation whenever you guys would like me to be a part of that. And then of course the autism uh, initiative. And again, I can't hammer this uh, home enough. The most important thing to visit Santa Cruz County to myself, to my staff, to my amazing staff is improving the quality of life for all of us that live here and love calling Santa Cruz County our home. So with that, I do thank you for having me here. I'm sorry it took three and a half months to come see you, but anytime you guys want me, I'm just right across the street. So I'm more than happy to come back anytime you guys want me to. We appreciate it. Now, thank you for the presentation. There are comments, uh, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Kukannon, and welcome to Santa Cruz County. It's really great uh, to see your enthusiasm and your, your innovation, too, of what you want to do. And uh, we'd be very interested to hear more about that as time goes on. Uh, there, it can't be overstated how important the uh, visitor industry is to Santa Cruz County, I think next to agriculture. Um, it's, it really is the most important that we have here. Uh, education, if you will classify that as a, a business of sorts, is very important as well. But uh, it's it's really great to have you here. And uh, I think the value of our tourism industry, it sounds like you want to enhance the opportunities for visitors to have here. And I want to thank you for your enthusiasm again. And uh, welcome to Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much, Joe. Supervisor Conner. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Concannon, for the presentation. It's great to see that our tourism industry is headed in the right direction. And uh, I would also pay attention to uh, some of the opportunities that could come into play here uh, as the sustainability update for the county hopefully becomes law soon. There was a lot in there uh, really trying to make it easier for um, small-scale agritourism businesses to take root um, and also for events. Uh, you know, I have several friends that work in the event planning wedding uh, space, and of course, one event can draw in hundreds of people, and uh, there should be more opportunity coming down the pipeline here uh, for more event spaces and more advertising, um, specifically around uh, events and agritourism. So hopefully, uh, lots of good growth ahead. Thanks. Thank you.
Any additional comments from my colleagues? Supervisor Cummings? I just want to thank you again for coming and presenting to the county board and to the community. And just a couple um, brief comments. If you haven't had a chance already, there's a group called the Autism Family Network here in Santa Cruz. They'll be great to reach out to, especially um, given your interest in those initiatives related to increasing tourism, making Santa Cruz a safe place for Name people. of the organization again, Autism Family Network. Yes. Okay. Great. And I'm happy to follow up with you. Um, and then, you know, if you have an opportunity to speak to our Disabilities Commission, I think that's a great place to kind of um, bring some of your ideas and um, get some support from our commissioners. And um, I think that's it for now. So I'm just really excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Hernandez. Thank you for the presentation as well. And I like the images of South County that you had. You know, um, speaking of South County, I think that there's a lot of, there's a few opportunities that we have in the agritourism industries. And you know, you mentioned one of them, but I think that we have exceptional uh, uh, wineries out in South County. I think a lot of them are, we kind of share them with Sachs District as well. But we have, you know, excellent uh, wines that match anything in, in Napa, especially the Chardonnays and Pinots. Um, but, you know, if we can expand sort of the wine trails and kind of build up whatever uh, kind of the economy there for them, you know, I think that that's a perfect um, avenue for South County wine trails and kind of the promotion of the of the excellent wines we have over there as well. Um, but uh, we can get in touch later on offline uh, about this as well. Thank you very much. So and thank you. That I've enjoyed to the extent that I very, uh, very many, not very many. Let's not put it that way. I've enjoyed some wines from the area. I, I could give you a little tour of them. <laughs> All right. This is a non-action item. It is a member of the community and chambers would like to address this on the Visit Santa Cruz presentation. Yes. Good morning. It's David Schwartz. Um, when I hear a presentation like this, it makes me think about how we can make a situation like this actually bring more money in to the county. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at your, your websites and such, and I think maybe you could offer spots in your uh, presentations to allow um, businesses to advertise and, and use that to support them. And that, that in that way, maybe the businesses could support us without it coming directly out of the budget. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Welcome. <laughs> Enjoy the fog. I grew up in the Eastern Oregon desert, so I know what it what a blessing it is to have this fog here in the cool temperatures that we all enjoy and the beauty that we all enjoy. Whenever I speak with someone that has never been here before, they are so taken by the beauty that we we all enjoy here. And at a gas station just last week, uh, someone came up and said they were visiting here. What would I recommend they do? And that was a very interesting question. They were international tourists. Um, I said, suggested the beaches. I suggested the woods. But I also suggested the Santa Cruz uh, UCSC Arboretum, which is a fabulous place. And they were very excited about that. I am a very pleased that you are considering those on the spectrum. I too know a lot of people and autism is on the rise in our population and uh, doing something that recognizes that and supports the, the people with this situation to come with their families is wonderful. Thank you. I would also ask that you consider uh, those with blind and low visible, low vision and hearing loss to make um, our county more friendly for them to be able to navigate. Um, agritourism is certainly a, a big thing here, especially in the South County. I would love to see the uh, Redmond Hirahara House restored and have something like a, a central place where people could go for agritourism seminars, educational and uh, really highlight the rich historical history of that place. It is an amazing story I would like to share with you. Um, the history tourism is also on the rise. So if our county can preserve our historic resources, that will help us as Thank well. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome again. Is there anybody else in chambers on this item? Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Call in user one. Your microphone's now available.
Erin Garrett, welcome to you. I um, used to teach in Watsonville uh, for over 20 years, and um, some of the problems in the county, I came up here in 81, and it was much more a nature scape with, with more trees and not all the microwave technology. I am not at the Board of Supervisors chambers because it is too painful with all the Wi-Fi and the cell tower outside and I, that's why I call in. And you stated, and I shared this goal, Everything we do is to improve the quality of life of our residents. And some of the, how do we do that? Some of the ways are to remove the harm of these uh, radiation emitting sites that kill the birds and the bees and us too, uh, to require ecological organic agriculture and remove the pesticides. I used to have to take my children in from the playground because the pesticides adjacent to um, a Manistee school were coming over the playground and they're coughing. We shouldn't have these poisons. Autism, some of the causes are the vaccines. You might look into uh, correlating when did autism come on in children. There are many books on this. Also, um, autism is linked to exposures of the mother during pregnancy and high. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. All right. Thank you for your presentation. We appreciate it. It was a non-action item. We do have a 1045 scheduled item, so uh, and it's 1040, so we, we're not going to be able to do item 9 right now just because of the timing of it. But my understanding is item 10 should be pretty quick, so I'm going to take item 10 out of order, which is a public hearing to consider application 231402, proposal to rezone portions of APN 089121-82 and 089-121-83 from the Special Use and Timber Production Zone District to determine the proposal is exempt from the requirements of CEQA and approving concept and ordinance amending zoning plan and map pursuant to chapter 13.10 of the Santa Cruz County Code, changing from one zone district to another and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on December 12, 2023 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the agenda board memo, the CEQA notice exemption and the ordinance amending the chapter of the Planning Commission resolution and the staff report. And uh, I apologize because I don't think they were anticipating that I was going to take this out of order, but uh, Mr. Palacios, I'm sorry, the um, staff is not present, and so we'll have to come back to that item. That's okay. People like listening to me reading items. Okay, so, sorry about that. Yeah, no, I've got that kind of radio thing going. Um, so what I'll do instead is uh, there's, uh, I mean, we really uh, need to wait until 1045 because there's notice for 1045, so the board's going to take just a five-minute recess, and we're going to come back at 1045 to hear the green building item. Or, yeah, the green program, excuse me. You. 
Everybody, welcome back. Thank you for your understanding and patience. We have a 1045 schedule item. We'll just pretend the clock says 1045. Uh, this is item 11. It's the presentation of the 2324 Santa Cruz County Green Business Certification and Recertification Awards. It's a very uh, positive event that we have here. And uh, as outlined in the memo, the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. Um, Bill Hoxford, I believe, is uh, the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure Recycling and Solid Waste Services is here, as well as Claudia and Jackie from Environmental Innovations, the County's Green Business Partner Program. Um, Mr. Hoxford, I'll turn it over to you to kick this item off. Thank you for your patience this morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, board, Chair Friend. Uh, on behalf of the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure, uh, we are pleased to be here presenting the Green Business uh, Awards. All of the recipients here today have received their certificates for completion of certifying or recertifying as a green business. However, we would like to formally recognize them today for their achievements. I would like to give a brief history of the program before yielding my time to our partners in implementing the program, Claudia Vialta Mejia and Jackie Casarena de Villa with Environmental Innovations. The county's green business certification program is an incentive-based program designed to encourage businesses to meet and exceed environmental standards and to conserve natural resources. The businesses that have been certified have voluntarily reduced water consumption, retrofitted lights, and made other electrical modifications to reduce energy consumption. These businesses have also reduced solid waste through recycling and smarter purchasing and have gone above and beyond regulatory requirements by implementing pollution prevention practices in their businesses. The county certification process involves a series of rigorous audits by environmental and conservation experts to come up to come up with the best available technology to prevent pollution and conserve natural resources. Certified businesses have invested significant time effort and financial resources to ensure that they meet the criteria for certification. These businesses are the industry front runners and that meet and exceed environmental exceptional exceptional environmental standards. The County of Santa Cruz began its green business program in 2003, uh, which means this year marks the 20th anniversary of the program in Santa Cruz County. California Green Business Certification Program is endorsed by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Toxic Substances Control. Funding for the, funding for the Santa Cruz County Green Business Program is, is provided by Recycling and Solid Waste Services, Sanitation, Zone 5 Flood Control District, Countywide Flood Control District, and the Pajaro Storm Drain, Storm Drain Maintenance District, it's hard to say. Environmental Innovations has been consulting uh, green businesses since 2007, and we're excited to be presenting again this year. We would like to thank this board for your support to keep the program alive and successful. So now I'd like to hand the presentation to Claudia and Jackie, who will give a presentation highlighting the accomplishments of the green business program over the last year. Thank you. Good morning, board and chair friend. Um, Environmental Innovations is a local consulting group who manages and supports sustainability programs for the city of Watsonville, Santa Cruz County, and the city of Santa Cruz. We specialize in regulatory compliance, including SB 1383 and pollution prevention, which we conduct in the city of Scotts Valley and city of Capitola. Our partners and outreach ap approach are community-based, which is shaped by our equity committee. Being community-based ensures we are providing resources like rebates where they are needed. We staff mostly bilingual coordinators like Jackie and I to best serve our diverse community. The California Green Business Network is made up of individual programs within cities and counties across the state, three of which are located within the Santa Cruz County. Environmental Innovations coordinates and supports 
for the City of Watsonville, Santa Cruz County, and City of Santa Cruz's green business programs. We are a resource hub for the business community. The outreach we do allows us to provide local tools that help small business owners achieve sustainability. We connect them to financial opportunities like grants, rebates, as well as introduce them to partners like Ecology Action and Green Waste, who provide EV chargers and organic spins for compliance, as examples. With our expert support and technical assistance, we help businesses save energy, waste, and water, all while cutting business costs and greenhouse gas emissions. Because we've worked with hundreds of businesses, we have experience problem solving and working through environmental hurdles without using too much of their time. These three distinct examples show the extent of our green business programs. For Bonitas Fashion, we connected the business owner to resources that provide additional funding, including a $1,000 mini grant uh, from Intuit for an electronic point of sale system that helps reduce paper use in her office. For Catalpa Street Garage, they pushed above the envelope um, and earned our highest level of recognition, which is Innovator. Lastly, we certify a variety of businesses, including government buildings like the City of Watsonville's administrative offices. The city wanted to set a good example to its businesses and decided to enroll and complete our green business program. Another component of our program are recognition events, like this Board of Supervisors meeting, um, and celebrations, including mixers and networking events. So here is a video of our most recent county mixer at Discretion Brewing. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight and celebrating Santa Cruz businesses' shared commitment to sustainability. We welcome you to food and fun. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from three distinct players in the sustainability game. My name is Gail Pellerin. I was elected to the State Assembly in November. And, you know, California has a long history of driving innovations for climate, climate energy, and environmental sustainability, and is committed to 100% renewable energy by 2045. Thank you for everything you do in the business community to make sure that we're able to meet these goals. 175,000 uh, pounds of greenhouse gas emissions avoided each year. That's in the city. Six times that in the county. That's like taking 108 cars off the road. You also have conserved almost... <laughs> no. Sorry, we will make that video available on our website so that everybody can finish watching it. <laughs> there we go. So when we look at the environmental outcomes of one business, the number seems small. But when we look at our entire green business community over an extended period of time, we have some really high impact outcomes. So over the last 12 months, Santa Cruz County businesses have saved the are the CO2 equivalent of planting over 7,000 acres of urban trees. When looking at a business's solid waste diversion, this could be adding organic spins or properly training employees, we can see savings that equate to over 240 garbage trucks worth of trash diverted away from the landfill. In terms of water, we can see that businesses saved over 150,000 bathtubs worth of potable water. And finally, looking at hazardous or universal waste, things like batteries, bulbs, and other items that shouldn't go into the trash, we can see that our educational approach is key to helping businesses and the environment be healthy and sustainable. We've certified 62 businesses, a combination of new certifications and recertifications. This success demonstrates the longevity and commitment that many of our businesses, partners, and local governments have to the sustainability of our environment. That concludes our portion of the presentation. Now we turn it back to the board who will acknowledge their businesses. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, and thank you for your outstanding work, all three of you. Uh, the names of the businesses that have qualified for this year's Green Business Award will now be read by supervisorial districts so that representatives of these businesses can stand together as a group to be recognized for their efforts. As your business is called, please stand up and remain standing until we've read the names of all the businesses. And uh, just as a note, please hold your applause until the end of the reading. We're going to start the businesses in my colleague's first district here, announced by Supervisor Koenig, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm excited to announce that the first district businesses that have received certification include Main Street Elementary, Catalpa Street Garage, Santa Cruz County Sanitation District, Mountain Elementary School District, Discretion Brewing, Monterey Bay Mortgage, Two Birds Books, Wild Beauty Cosmetics, Deborah Lindsay Company, Extraordinary Construction, the Penny Ice Creamery on 41st Avenue, and Harbor Health Center. Please. Thank you all. all right, we'll move on to the second district and the businesses here include the Capitola Veterinary Hospital, Ad Manor, Ethos Santa Cruz, the Maynard Group, Avocado Winery, Kickback, and the Penny Ice Creamery in Aptos Village. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Supervisor Cummings. All right. So in the third district, we have the Coastal Watershed Council, we have Shoppers Corner Incorporated, Davenport Resource Center, UCSC Fleet. Lil Jacks, Environmental Innovations, Sock Shop and Shoe Company, Stacy Mitchell Realtor, Alta Coffee, Time People Santa Cruz, Gazelle Bikes, and Braidwork LLC. So let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. And the wonderful fourth district supervisor Hernandez. And in the fourth district, I want to acknowledge and thank all the businesses for the commitment and sustainability and for sustainability and, con and conserving natural resources. The first business is BB's Threading Salon, Mount Madonna Center and Institute, Slice Project, Starlight Elementary School, TBH Studio, Revive Hair Salon, Oasis Beauty Salon. Rosalind's Jewelry, Tropicana, CSI Services, Pearl Valley Travel and CSI Services, Watsonville Senior Center, Hernandez and J Sports, Hernandez Toy and Gift Shop, no relation by the way, Valerie's Crafts, Yeye's Clothing, Lucy's Fashion, Second Harvest Food Bank, and Bonita's Fashion. City of Watsonville Administrative Offices, Forever Fly Skate Shop and Apparel, JC Jewelers and Designers, Queen's Shoes and More, and Freedom Tax Service. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, 4th District representing right there. Um, Supervisor McPherson, the 5th District. Thank you very much. I want to thank each and every one of you for making this just an environmental protection center of California and the nation that takes a village to really give us the environmental protection that we need. And you're each and every one of you are to be congratulated. In District 5, we have the Steel Bonnet Brewing Company, Eric's Deli Cafe, Scotts Valley Chamber of Commerce, Christine Painting, Santa Cruz County Office of Education, Scotts Valley Recreation, the Penny Ice Creamery, Scotts Valley, <laughs> and Soul Hot Yoga. Congratulations. This is always a, a wonderful program every 
uh, single year. So on behalf of the County of Santa Cruz, I want to thank all the, obviously all these businesses that, that were recognized today and also those that have been recognized for multiple years of your certifications. Uh, we're inviting all of you to a reception that's being hosted by CDI uh, right outside here. I want to give an opportunity for my colleagues to make uh, brief comments before we have a, a final round of applause and an opportunity for people to uh, have the reception. Any additional comments from my colleagues? Sure, I'll just add that. Um, again, thank you for making these investments in our community. I enjoy this opportunity to, to recognize you guys, and I hope our community in turn uh, continues to invest in your businesses by frequenting them. Um, and it's really impressive, not only then, um, you know, what each of you guys are doing individually, but the collective impact that this program has. So thank you for being a part of this. All right, beautiful. So, oh, please, Mr. Buzzer Cummings. I just want to thank uh, the staff for all their work on this and also the community members who have made the commitment to really trying to make our community as environmentally friendly as possible. I mean, we recently received a report on NOAA and uh, the amount of waste that we see going in our oceans that we see in Monterey Bay, some of which is plastic from tobacco waste and some of which is from food retailers. And so I just hope that we can continue to use this data to help us continue to push this message out to the community that collectively we can all make a difference. And, you know, that you all are, are the start to that. And so I just hope we can continue to inspire other businesses in our community. And so thank you all for all your hard work on this. Supervisor Hernandez and the couple of businesses you apparently now own in Watsonville. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I'd like to thank, you know, all of the, the, uh, Green Business um, Organization, Claudia and Jackie, all the hard work they did that they do. I see, I see them throughout District Four talking to businesses all the time, hard at work. And I'd like to thank you know our county CDI, City of Watson, for all their work that they do. And most of all, I'd like to thank all the businesses that are participating in here today. You guys are the ones that that make this program, and you guys are the ones that make our county green. So thank you for all the work that you guys do, and all the work that you guys do as well. So thank you. Thank you. It's a non-action item, but are there any members of the community, because this is a public item, that would like to address us on this presentation? Please. Yeah, David Schwartz. Just real quickly, you guys do a great job. I really appreciate what you're doing. I just want to think about a way to make that revenue neutral so that actually the business community supports you 100% and we can really make it a bigger program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Tim, De Tim Delaney. Uh, I live up at the top of Summit. Thank you so much. I, I really, really like what I saw in the presentation. I think the, the the environmental work is fabulous here in Santa Cruz County, just so you know. And I want to point out on the presentation for uh, Placer County, TRPA, those folks, you might want to put make that red on that map up there. What they're doing up in Lake Tahoe is terrible, okay? The, the lead cable in the lake, it's been there for multiple decades. We know it's poisoning the lake and the fish over there by uh, Fallen Leaf Lake and so on. You know, and now you, now it's tied up a court with AT&T. If I was a politician, I would have knocked that out. I would have got that out of there a long time ago. That's how I operate as a human being. Also, the way they're treating Native Americans in the Tahoe Basin, it is absolutely terrible. The whole concept that you would carve a bike trail so a Lance Armstrong strong e bike guy can go sailing through East Shore Forest where golden eagles and bald eagles are there, okay, historically. And this is sacred Native American land, okay? That's appalling. That would irritate the entire U.S. military and every Native American in the entire country. It is ridiculous. And also, healthcare-wise, just so you know, about three weeks ago or so, Prime Healthcare that runs St. Mary's Hospital and Carson Tahoe Hospital, they unsafe discharged a 50-something Native American lady, and it was multiple times, and also a VA nurse tried to tell them to cut it out, and they did it again, and this Native American lady was found in an alley a short ways from the, the hospital, dead, so they killed her, okay? So that's not the way you treat Native American people. And I hope that you folks can recognize that and motivate the state of California and the federal government to change the behavior in the Tahoe Basin. Right, thank, thank you so much. And the item before us are Green Business Awards in Santa Cruz County. So if we can make sure that we keep our comments relevant to the item. 
Thank you. We are one planet, aren't we? <laughs> so um, thank you for your work. It's a lot of work to go through all of these applications and make sure that things are making a difference. I appreciate your work. And I appreciate the efforts that all of these business owners have done um, coming up, stepping up to the plate on their own. I would like to see some sort of a real outreach to the the people who are out there shopping. We vote with our feet, so let's support them in their efforts and support others who may be wanting to step up to the plate and uh, make these good changes in their businesses. Let's give them an incentive to do so and uh, have people vote with their feet to support them. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair. Jenny, your microphone's now available. Jenny, go ahead and if you still wish to speak, you can accept the unmute. And if you no longer wish to speak, feel free to lower your hand. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move on to call in user two. Marilyn Garrett, is this green business or greenwashing? Corporations privatize the profit and socialize the cost. So we're to recycle their toxic products. Plastics, which are everywhere, microplastics everywhere, endangering people. I have a book here called Toxic Sludge is Good for You, Lies, Damn Lies, and the Public Relations Industry by John Stauber and Sheldon Rampton. And the, the lights that are energy efficient are biologically harmful. Some people can hardly go into stores because of the LED lights now. Here's a quote from the book, Toxic Sludge is Good for You. Burson Marsteller says its international operations are linked together electronically and philosophically to deliver a single standard of excellent, unquote, excellence. It claims that, quote, the role of communications is to manage perceptions which motivate behaviors that create business results. We are totally focused on this idea as our mission. Bertrand Marsteller helps clients manage issues by influencing in the right combination public attitudes, public perceptions, public behavior, and public policy, unquote. I think that's what's going on here. Awards for what is perceived to be good for the environment, but in fact is the opposite. Thank you, Ms. Kerr. Is there anybody else online? Yes, Chair. Jenny, your microphone's now available, and as a reminder, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, we have somebody here in chambers, so we can come back. I mean, would you like to address us on this item? Yes, please. Thank you. My name is still James Ewing Whitman. You know, I want to start out by saying the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, the people behind me, I believe most of them have good intentions. They may be well informed. Anybody can listen to my public comments this morning in this room that were really quite direct to different intentions. So Gail Peller, and I believe, was reinforcing that we're going to be carbon neutral by 2045, you know, I don't expect anybody to believe a word I say, but if you talk to anybody who does greenhouse work, who grows plants for food and wants to accelerate their growth, it's a higher CO2. Right now, my understanding is we have a CO2 of 
419 parts per million. When you go back through geologic time, that's uh, planet Holocaust and genocide. So the previous caller was correct about the technologies that are going on. You, know, you look up in this room, and the lights are about 27 Kelvin. You go outside in the street lights, they're 5,000 Kelvin. They're designed for you to look down. They're not healthy. We are in situations of control grids. And I would assume many of the businesses that spoke and you guys are calling out are only in business because they kiss the asses of government to keep their businesses in, in line and open. You know, the amount of businesses that have been destroyed by the practices in this room where these supervisors, you know, this is, this is a charter county. You know, you, these individuals that are supposedly supposed to support the people, they're being controlled by the county manager. And, you know, the county attorney is supporting that. So I think that people have good intentions, but a little bit of education could go a long ways because who knows how difficult the next years are going to come. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers? And we'll try one last time online. Jenny, your microphone is now available, and it's star six to go ahead and mute or unmute yourself. You can also go ahead and click the accept unmute that I'm sending you. <clears throat> All right, we will close public comment on this item. It's a non-action item as we're saying. First off, a round of applause for all the, the businesses. Uh, you're encouraged to participate in a reception out. Uh, unfortunately, the board has a couple more board items that we need to continue on, but thank you for your, your outstanding work and, and for all the local businesses. I will take item 10 out of order because I know that he's here now. Uh, I know that the item is going to be brief, which is a public hearing to consider application uh, 231402 proposal to rezone portions of APN 089-121-82 and 089-181-83 from special use to timber protection zone district to determine the proposals, the, excuse me, the proposals exempt from the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act and the proven concept, the ordinance amending the zoning plan and map pursuant to chapter 13.10 of the county code, changing from one district to another, schedule the ordinance for final adoption on the December 12, 2023 meeting and take related actions outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO, uh, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the agenda board item, the sequel notice of exemption, the ordinance, the Planning Commission resolution, minutes, and the staff report. Uh, Mr. Dittmars, welcome back for this item. Yes, uh, good morning. Evan Dittmars, Development Review Planner. Um, this is an application to uh, rezone one parcel with uh, two, two APNs. Um, it's approximately a 60-acre parcel. Uh, the proposal is to rezone from the special use zone district to the timber production zone district. Um, the project area is roughly 2.2 um, miles east of the Highway 9 and Bear Creek Road intersections. And uh, this land is uh, quite steep um, and uh, rugged, uh, re resulting in limited development potential. Uh, the, the existing zoning... Um, is uh, t totally 60 acres is bisected by a tax boundary. That's the uh, north south boundary you see um, adjacent to 089 12183. Um, it's one parcel uh, with two APN numbers, and there is a swath of land um, across from these parcels that carries a PF zoning, uh, public facilities, which is not proposed to be rezoned as part of this application. So the proposed zoning uh, in this image here shows that approximately 50 acres of TP zoned land um, would uh, would include the 10 acres of PF zoning on the north parcel. Um, there's no proposed or required changes to the zoning uh, or to the general plan designation on either of these parcels. It's uh, strictly zoning from special use TP uh, with the PF portion unchanged. Um, this um, this is a TP adjacency rezoning, which your board may be familiar with. There's been a few recently, but there were some um, members of the public who were interested in this section of code. It's facilitated by California Government Code Section 5111 3.5, which allows uh, an owner of TP zoned land to add additional land to their um, TP uh, to their timberland. Um, we've evaluated this project for consistency with the applicable code sections, um, including that the criteria 
um, is contiguous uh, with a, the adjacent TP zone property and under the ownership of one person, uh, that the property is timberland, which means it is capable of producing uh, a minimum um, uh, cubic feet of timber per acre. In this case, the forester um, and applicant for this project has demonstrated that it can uh, produce an average of 55.3 cubic feet of timber per acre annually. And finally, that the uses on the parcel, which is currently vacant, are um, including watershed, wildlife habitat, timber management, comply with the timber production uses in the in county code um, and as determined by the forester. Um, prior to and during the public comment portions at the October 11th Planning Commission hearing, there was quite a bit of uh, discussion from the neighborhood adjacent to um, this property. They were concerned about the noise, uh, the haul traffic, and a um, the status of a biotic easement on the PF zoned portion of the property. Um, and access to where the relevant timber harvest permit information um, was, where that information was available. Um, at the direction of the commission, um, that timber harvest permit application information was provided on the public noticing cards to the neighborhood prior to this meeting and was provided to any neighbor that reached out to me following that hearing. Um, and it's, it's important to note that the application under consideration today is uh, strictly to evaluate that the proposed rezoning is consistent with that aforementioned California government code and the applicable county policies. And that in, in that this proposal is facilitated by that government code, um, the county is limited in the scope of the approval uh, to the extent that we're compelled to approve the application to rezone without additional conditions. Um, the timber harvest itself is subject to its own review process, which is similar to CEQA um, and um, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection or CAL FIRE is uh, the responsible agency for reviewing and administering those timber harvest plans. So that timber harvest plan and that process is available um, to anyone interested um, through CAL FIRE. Uh, it's called it's called CalTrees. Uh, the website is called CalTrees. That information is, is made available. The timber harvest plan, the contact information for the forester and the applicant is all available online. But the scope of this proposal is simply to rezone and allow them to pursue that timber harvest permit application. So therefore, staff are recommending um, to uh, conduct a public hearing on application 231042 to make a determination that the proposal is exempt from further review under the California Environmental Quality Act, to approve in concepts the attached ordinance amending the zoning plan and map pursuant to Chapter 1310 of the Santa Cruz County Code, changing from one zone district to another, to approve this application 231042 based on the findings and conditions contained in the staff report to the Planning Commission, and to direct the clerk of the board to schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption at the December 12th, 2023 Board of Supervisors meeting. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from board members on this item? Uh, we'll open it up to the community on this, this item. This is a public hearing. So if we'd like to officially open up the public hearing for any questions or comments on this item. Good morning, welcome back. Yes, good morning, David Schwartz. Um, I, I, I think that this application is a good application. I don't see timber harvest tax in our revenue, but I know that we receive some of that and any timber harvesting that's done from uh, any any of these, there's a, a tax that's uh, generated from that and, and we are going to benefit from that. I don't know how much we benefit from it, but it, this is important. We need to use the natural resources we have responsibly and correctly. And I believe this plan is is not a clear cut type of plan. So uh, their their goal is to manage the forest in a proper way and in a in a way that's going to be better for our uh, environment. Um, my only concern about this, of course, is traffic and the trucks and things like that. And I hope that you've reached out to all the neighbors so that they're aware of what's going on, when and how this is going to impact them. And I know our roads are in, in pretty bad shape. So this kind of activity causes more destruction of that area. So we, we better be prepared to go back and make repairs to these areas when this is all done. But I, I applaud you for coming forward and I hope it all works out for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is anybody else like to speak to us during the public hearing specific to this item? Sure. 
Uh, my name is Tim Delaney, and I'll speak on this. And uh, I, I think what you're doing is pretty pretty good. I don't fully understand it. I do know a lot about force, you know. Uh, so hopefully, if it's uh, you know thinning and stuff like that, and, and designing a force, so once again we can have an old growth forest, uh, that that would be acceptable. You know, I know I always compare things to the Tahoe Basin going up there, just so you know, I had all kinds of land. There's only like 80 to 100,000 people, for example, living in Reno when I was a kid. And now there's like 800,000 in that valley. So I saw land in the desert and in the Tahoe Basin as a kid. I was walking through huge forests and I would backcountry ski and hike and camp behind these mountains that were over 10,000 feet during the winter. So, um, I know firsthand what a natural force looks like and what a force looks like that was once clear cut. And the Tahoe Basin is one of the earliest forests that was totally stripped. And so you can see a good example of a force trying to recover. And it's difficult to get society to accept that and to manage these forests and to not come in there and overdevelop and prevent these forests from coming back. So anyways, it's beneficial to wildlife, and that's the kind of work that I would like to see. I'd like to see Tahoe's forests come back and also the Santa Cruz Mountains that have larger trees once again in the future. So it's a couple hundred year, maybe a thousand year process in order for that to happen um, if man can kind of encourage it along instead of having fire burn out all these areas and do this naturally. Thank you very much. You take it easy. Thank you. Anybody else during the public hearing? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I live in the Redwoods. <laughs> um, and I, I appreciate that environment very much. I think um, I'm, I want to trust in CAL FIRE and their um, uh, evaluation of the, the timber harvest capability of this property. I have heard that it is very steep. My concern is how the harvesting would be done and would um, like to make sure that it will do the least amount of soil disturbance as possible to prevent erosion into the creeks. In that light, I hope that the uh, harvester will be Big Creek Lumber. They are very responsible and do things in always the best way, and they are a local family-owned business. What has not been mentioned is that with uh, thinning the trees, it will also provide um, a sense of uh, fire, wildfire risk reduction to that area. And um, perhaps that point can be made with the local residents because it can help maybe help their, their fire uh, insurance problems that we all in the mountains are experiencing. And... Um, Perhaps they can get some uh, money from this, uh, partnering with the, the property owner adjacent to help them do additional fire defensible space work around their homes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Michelle, your microphone is now available. Hi, I wanted to put in a public comment. Um, for me personally, uh, my experience of this whole thing has been one of frustration trying to access the information. Um, all the concerns that were raised at the October 7th meeting are still there. Proximity to housing, compromise of the stability and integrity of the hillside, noise, habitat destruction, ecosystem disruption, impact on the, on the wildlife, um, and truck, truck traffic, increased fire potential. I'm hoping that CAL FIRE can address this. I also hope that there are other professionals who advocate for the environment who um, are looking at this. So far, I haven't seen anything uh, as far as uh, things are being signed off on by the professionals who are not invested in the project. So, uh, I would say that I would like to see uh, more accessibility of what's actually happening. I don't think anybody in the neighborhood really understands what's going to happen, how it's going to impact. Um, there's rumors they're going to just strip the trees and leave the branches, uh, which are fire hazards. I don't know if that's true. But there's a lot of confusion, and there's a lot of um, uh, inaccessibility 
for information. In fact, I could not find the harvest plan online and I sent Evan Dittmars an email and he basically said, it's posted. I can't really tell you I had to go through back channels, but it's there. Um, that's not good enough for me. If I can't find it, it's not posted. So I want to see more active uh, interaction with the neighborhood uh, or at least accessible postings of information for the neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else online? Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, the previous speaker really listed the negative impacts of this project, which seem to be many. My guiding rule, if I were to governor, were to say whatever project is proposed, where is your proof of safety and not harm to the residents and the environment and the wildlife? And if you can't provide evidence of first do no harm, the rule should be you can't do it. I've seen, that's my opinion, many negative declarations to California Environmental Quality Act that shouldn't have been there. Many of them with cell towers that are known to cause environmental harm. Other areas as well. Uh, the potential for landslides later, erosion into the creeks um, is, is great. It, it, <laughs> Everything's going forward by money for certain interests. Also, the wording timberland, land, timber harvest instead of forest land, um, you know, naturescape, and a reference geoengineeringwatch.org about why the forests are dying all over and the weather is so uh, catastrophic globally. Thank you. That's my comments. I urge a no vote. Thank you. Is there anybody else online? Yes, Chair. Jane, your microphone's now available. Um, my name is Jane Warheater. I live at Five Meadow Drive in this neighborhood. I appreciate Michelle's um, thoughtful um, statement that, in fact, information has not been readily flowing to us, despite um, the kind of glad handing by the forester and the property um, representative at the October meeting. Um, indicating that, yes, maybe we could have a, a walkthrough or maybe, you know, just get in touch with us and we'll provide some more information for you. That has really, there has really been no um, degree of outreach. Um, in the meantime, we are talking about what sounds like some sort of a foregone conclusion based on the criteria being met uh, for the state law that um, necessarily indicates this is going to be rezoned. Um, that's really problematic. Um, I remember at the planning commission meeting, um, one of the um, one of the commissioners said, "Well, this is a great time for you to become legally involved and you know make it make a change to the law if it's not working for you." In fact, I see this as a matter for the county to say um, the best way to actually protect. Um, locals and the neighbor the neighborhood um, in particular this neighborhood but also uh, maintain local control here is to maybe say no to this what what seems like a foregone conclusion um, there might be a lawsuit um, who's better to deal with that the county or the residents of this county um, individuals um, in the meantime Yes, there are traffic concerns. There are wildfire concerns. I don't believe that the wildfire mitigation is going to happen. Um, I believe that we're going to remove meaningful redwood stands that are marketable and we'll be stuck with um, undergrowth and a tinderbox. Thanks again. Thank you. Amy, your microphone's now available.
As a reminder, Amy, it's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, this is Martin Wiedemann. Uh, I'm also a um, resident of this area, and um, I'd like to echo some of the things that the uh, previous speakers talked about, uh, saying that uh, we have gotten very little information from uh, the forester to what they're actually planning on doing. Uh, the sign where they uh, are proposing this um, uh, change of uh, zoning is a very small sign that is very, um, you, you would never come upon it unless you're walking right in front of it. My main concern is um, there are two access points to this property. And the one that is most likely going to be the area where they are going to be taking the logging trucks is a very small road, and it goes over an even smaller bridge. And this bridge being impacted with giant lumber trucks is not going to – it's going to destroy the bridge. And there's no um, – in and all of our roads up here are so fragile – we still have our fixing roads that were damaged one, two storms ago or two years ago. Bear Creek has just opened up after two months and it's still a one lane road. Our roads, Bear Creek Road and um, this neighborhood roads and the bridges in this area cannot sustain uh, the type of logging trucks that they are proposing to do. Um, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Philip, your microphone's now available. Hi, uh, my name is Philip DeGreen. I'm also a resident of Bear Creek Estates. Uh, I uh, wanted to thank several of the previous speakers, um, Michelle and Jane in particular. Uh, my main concern with this proposal is that uh, uh, as other speakers have said, we have uh, very few details about what the foresting plan is, uh, and I'm very uh, worried about the increased wildfire protection. I know one of the speakers uh, suggested that uh, timber harvest actually decreases um, wildfire risk, and countless studies show that is not the case at all. They're going to come in and take the big marketable lumber and leave the smaller trees and the underbrush, which is in danger of burning. Um, this is not going to help our fire insurance. It's not going to help uh, our fire protection. Uh, this is going to help the loggers only. Um, so I would like to hear more details about what their plans are to mitigate fire risk uh, following their timber harvest. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, your microphone is now available. Hi, my name's Laurel, and I am um, also a resident of this area. And I um, I wanted to reiterate a lot of the things that have been said. And one of the things that um, has been, I was at the uh, other hearing as well, and um, one of the things that was talked about, particularly by the owner and the forester that got up and talked, was that we would be, as neighbors, we would be invited to go on a walk of the area. I haven't had any response to any correspondence that I've attempted um, regarding any information on a meeting, as they suggested that could happen so that we could see a little bit about where they're going to be taking these large trees. We have very, very steep slopes behind our houses that it, last year we were very impacted with all the rains and um, the water and the mud that came down the hills and onto our properties has required a lot of us to do um, retaining walls. And um, I think that will further with decreased um timber on the on the hillsides uh to keep it stable so along with all the other suggestions or um issues that people have brought up including the traffic and the the roads is a big one 
and the fire danger. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that we really haven't heard much um, from the forester and would I'd love to know what the plan is. And I agree also that if there's any way to not approve this, I am I'm I'm up for not approving this. So thank you for listening. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, and thank you for everybody that shared their comments during the public hearing. I see nobody else in chambers that would like to participate. So, we, oh, please step forward. This was the opportunity has been set. Is this? Are there any additional speakers here in chambers that would like to address us during the public oh, hearing? Yeah, you know, please, please step forward. This will be the last speaker, and then we'll close the public hearing. Hello, I'm Bartley Carlson. I'm the forestry technician that did most of the work out on here. I would mostly just like to make my presence known so that if there's any questions, I have seen this property from both the bottom to the very top. And if there is any questions regarding the rezone of this property, I'm not sure that I can be of huge help. That's mostly a discussion of the Forest Productivity Act. But if there's a question about the property, I can help you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing uh, and bring it back to the board for consideration. Is there a motion? Yeah, uh, that, this is in the 5th District, of course. Um, and I think the issues that have been uh, Mentioned here, I, I think this has been adequately addressed um, uh, in planning and public safety agencies, and I think it complies with the timber production zone. Uh, I'd like to thank the planning commission staff and the work for the work on this, and like to notice, uh, also notice that the land trust is approved or of this, uh, and I would move the recommended actions that this be approved. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Is there additional discussion? If we got a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Javars, and for everybody's participation in the public hearing. We'll move on to the last item, the regular agenda, before we move into our closed session, which is item nine, to consider adopting resolutions calling for a special election on March 5th, 2024, for a countywide measure to increase the unincorporated area sales tax by one half cent and establishing budget priorities if the sales tax measure passes and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the agenda item board memo, a resolution calling for an election, the resolution supporting budget priorities, county sales tax measure fact sheet, and the county sales tax measure FAQ. And we have our assistant county administrative officer, Nicole Coburn here. <clears throat> Welcome hey. back. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Almost afternoon uh, to our friend and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer, and I'm here to talk about Agenda not number 9, um, which is regarding an unincorporated area sales tax. So a little bit about our presentation today, I'm just going to cover some background on the county and talk about some of our um, accomplishments. We have numerous that things that we've been able to accomplish in recent years, as well as some top priorities for the public and things that we want to work on moving forward. And then I'll move into the proposed measure, um, as well as um, our fiscal stewardship as a county. So as you know, um, the county um, of Santa Cruz is somewhat unique in that um, we serve uh, over half of the county population. We have two rules here at the county of Santa Cruz. Um, we have both our stand, state mandated countywide services that we provide, as well as more city-like municipal services that are similar to the to the cities. Um, we like to say we are the biggest city in the county because of, of the wide breadth of services that we provide in the unincorporated area, and that makes us somewhat unique. Um, we are also um, serve a much higher portion of the population than some of our peers. As you could see here, we serve about 50% or more than half of the population compared to a peer average of almost 16%. At the same time, we receive a lot less revenue per capita than our peers. Um, here, as you can see here, we have about $460 per resident in property tax compared to a peer average of almost 4,000. This creates some challenges for us just in terms of providing those dual functions and serving the county both in our unincorporated area and providing those state mandated services. While Santa Cruz County is a really a beautiful place to call home, the county faces a variety of difficult challenges. Um, I know it's no surprise to you, but we are facing a housing crisis here in our county. Um, frontline workers like nurses, teachers, childcare providers, first responders, 
emergency personnel and other essential workers are really struggling with the cost of living and the short of, of homes in our county. Four in 10 residents are renters with nearly half spending 35% or more of their total income on housing. Since 1980, the San Santa Cruz County has added 80,000 people, but only 26,000 housing units. And we have a great housing dashboard on our website that I encourage everyone to go to that has some good um, graphical displays of what's happened in our county as well as what we're doing to address the housing crisis. Additionally, as climate change continues to threaten our community, it is becoming increasingly critical to fund and provide wildfire, flood, and emergency response, prevention programs, and disaster recovery services. To date, the county's climate change-driven disasters, as well as the pandemic, have cost the county $242 million. We've had to issue some debt to pay for some of those costs. Um, and this year alone, we issued debt of $61 million. And then we have at least another $80 million in damages that were um, remain unfunded and that we're figuring out how to fund. This situation has depleted our available cash balances and severely limited our ongoing recovery efforts, um, as well as limiting our ability to prepare for and respond to future disasters. As you can see on the chart on the right, um, just in terms of the general purpose revenues that we have as a county, it comes to about $210 million. Uh, so those $242 million of disaster costs is 115% of what we receive annually here as a county in, in just general purpose revenues. Despite our challenges, um, we've been taking a lot of action here at the county to invest in our community and we've been seeing results. Um, as you know, we saved Watsonville Community Hospital and we as a county had a five and a half million dollars investment in saving that hospital. We've also partnered to build um, affordable housing and medical clinics at, on Capitola Avenue. We purchased the Westridge, Bil Westridge Building and are establishing a South County Service Center We've secured funding for the Pajaro Levy Project. We've invested in library and parks improvements across the county, and we fortified uh, first responder facilities and services such as the DNA Lab and the Recovery Center. Um, with respect to housing, we completed our sustainability update, um, worked on code modernizations, and completed the housing element to promote housing development. Um, also recently, we established the County Office of the Public Defender, which is invest, which is working on providing holistic defense. And we have our Housing for Health Division that's working on various housing initiatives and, and serving our persons who are unhoused. In addition, um, amidst our climate change driven disasters, we proactively established an office dedicated to addressing these issues. That office is the Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience. Um, they have established a climate action and adaptation plan that they're working on operationalizing with departments. That's going to provide a roadmap for mitigating against climate change field events. They're also working on updating our emergency operations management plan to be more effective and increase multi-agency coordination. And they established the cruise aware system to advance public notifications for our emergencies. So moving forward, um, I want to touch on, based on um, a recent polling that we conducted over the summer, the public has a high interest in seeing the county invest in these three areas, wildfire and emergency response, roads, potholes, and parks, and then issues that relate to being a healthy and safe community. Providing disaster response, prevention, and recovery is the public's um, top priority based on our polling. 86% of county voters rate it important with over half calling it very important. This polls higher than anything else. As I've discussed, we've done a really amazing job in responding to pandemics, wildfires, floods, and more, but there's more that we can do and should be done. Repairing streets and potholes and providing parks and recreation is also important to the public. Um, as you know, we manage over 600 miles of roads that connect us to schools, libraries, parks, and businesses. And for every $2 in local investment that we make into transportation in our road network, the county gets $9 in state and federal funds. Lastly, supporting frontline workers, including nurses, emergency responders, and educators is a major public priority. 
We can accomplish that by working um, on our providing competitive compensation, providing affordable housing options through pre-development work, especially as it relates to our county campuses, um, pro by providing internships and apprenticeships that will help foster the next generation to link people within our community to the county in public service. The public see also sees a need for expanding mental health services for children and vulnerable populations, and we are doing this through the efforts of our public defender as well as our health services agency. And most recently, we've been working on building a state-of-the-art crisis residential center um, or in, in Mid-County for children who need these services the most. That gives you an idea of um, things that the county still needs to work on. Sure. So I wanna touch on um, our local sales tax. So the county sales tax rate is currently 9%, and this is tied with the lowest rate in our county. Um, the city of Capitola is currently tied with us at that 9% rate, as you can see here. The city of Santa Cruz is currently at nine and a quarter percent, and both the cities of Watsonville and Scotts Valley are at the statutory cap of nine and three quarters. The city of Santa Cruz just last week recently placed a half cent sales tax measure on their ballot, which will appear in March. Um, it's important to know that um, if the county and the city both appear on the ballot in March, these taxes are independent of one another. Um, people who buy goods and services in the city of Santa Cruz will pay that rate, and our rate will be only applicable to the unincorporated area. Um, our measure would be voted on countywide, but there's just one rate that's paid depending on where you are in the county. In August of 2023, the county worked with EMC Research to conduct a survey of Santa Cruz County voters who were likely to vote in March of 2024. Um, this measure uh, polled on increasing the unincorporated area sales tax by a half a percent or one half cent. Key findings show that initial support for the sales tax measure is above the ma majority threshold for passage. This is consistent with our past polling when we, we've gone out to voters to see um, what voter sentiment is like. Um, staff recommends that the board place a half cent sales tax measure on the ballot to provide a vital resource for addressing many of the community needs, including those that I just went over. A potential measure could be used to provide wildfire, flood, and emergency response prevention programs and disaster recovery services. It could also be used to repair streets and potholes and attract and retain frontline workers, including those nurses and emergency responders provide mental health services for children in vulnerable populations and maintain and improve our neighborhood parks. The anticipated annual revenue that would be raised by this measure is approximately $10 million, and it would ensure that we as a county have the necessary financial resources to execute local programs and services. You can see the proposed ballot measure here on this slide. Um, if approved, um, the sales tax would be effective 110 days later. So um, we're estimating that would be July 1st of 2024. So in the next fiscal year of 2024-25, uh, we're estimating that the annual revenue, just based on when we would start to receive the cash, would be about seven and a half million or three quarters of what we would receive annually. Um, they're concurrent with this ballot measure that you see here. We are also recommending that the board adopt a resolution that's also attached to the item that would establish some key budget priorities for the county to address the key challenges we're facing. These priorities areas are um, housing and essential workforce retention. We're asking the board to prioritize a million dollars in this area, uh, countywide homelessness services, um, we're also asking the board to prioritize another million dollars to support year-round 24-hour navigation centers and services throughout the county. Um, climate resiliency in county parks is a third area with an equal amount that we're asking the board to prioritize to support those disaster response and recovery prevention programs, as well as our neighborhood parks. And then the fourth priority area is the road repair and infrastructure projects. Um, we're asking the board to prioritize, again, another million dollars to repair streets and potholes and address some of our infrastructure needs. And the remainder revenue would be used to support any other essential county services that we have, um, including um, our mental health services that we're planning to provide in mid-county and improving public safety.
Well, the proposed sales tax measure would be voted on countywide. It would be applied exclusively to unincorporated areas of Santa Cruz County, as I mentioned. Um, it's important to note that public disclosure of this funding would be made through the county's annual budget and financial audit. Um, also, purchasing essential items such as groceries, prescription medication, diapers, fem feminine hygiene products are all exempt from the sales tax. All of this revenue would stay here in Santa Cruz County for you for our use, you know, based on our priorities, and it would they would address our challenges and needs, helping us to invest more in our county. So with that, I'm happy to answer your questions, and I would ask that you uh, approve the recommended actions in the staff report. Thank you. Um, I imagine there may be some questions. I'll start with just a brief question, just to make sure that there's a it's exceptionally clear on the ballot language. It says that it'll um bring in when fully enacted i should say 10 million dollars a year and you had a previous slide that showed that not 100 percent of the sales tax goes to uh, local government because there's a split between the state and special districts so is the 10 million specific to the county as an organ as, as an entity or is this is that the gross just to make clear the the community and then there's a split from there yeah, that is, the 10 million is just, it's our portion based on the half a cent that we would get here in the county that would be added to that pie chart that you saw there. Great, thank you. Are there uh, questions from my colleagues on this item? Uh, Supervisor Hernandez? You know, I think you had me at the three P's, right? The parks, uh, uh, potholes, and public safety. And But I, one that I'm really interested in is the workforce retention. I think that that's been uh, one of the things that, that we really have to address at the county level and making sure that we have proper staffing levels for, you know, we had this, we had this uh, report that we had for behavioral health. And so we haven't had uh, proper uh, staffing levels there, but also in our, in our public, in our sheriffs, we haven't had proper uh, staffing levels. So I really, you know, hope that it really does meet the demand to uh, properly staff a lot of our departments and a lot of our workforce that we need. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Koenig. Sure. Thank you, Chair. You know, the well, thank you for the fantastic presentation. I think it really makes it clear why uh, we're considering doing this. Um, the most common question I get when talking about this uh, potential sales, or sales tax measure out in the community is, well, we know there's inflation. But sales taxes, by definition, increase when there's inflation. So shouldn't the existing sales taxes be keeping up with the increased costs? And I think what you demonstrated very clearly is that we're, the county is actually being asked to do more than ever before. The county is really left holding the bag, dealing with the externalities from the climate crisis and the housing crisis. We have to, I mean, as, as you showed, more than a year's worth of our general fund revenues are uh, have have been spent uh, just in responding to recent climate disasters. Um, and then, as also been mentioned, um, with the cost of housing increasing as rapidly as it has in uh, recent years, we have to ultimately increase salaries in order to stay competitive and attract people uh, to our area and fill those positions to provide services to the public. So. Fundamentally, that's why we need to consider a, a new sales tax measure is because the county is actually doing more than it has in the past. You know, I think it's for, we should, be, of course, uh, with the board approves this today, it will go out to uh, the public to vote on whether or not they want to approve this. Um, and I don't think it's an unreasonable uh, proposed increase. I mean, the, the county would still be, it still wouldn't be the highest taxing entity in within, within our region um and a lot of people uh, we live in such an expensive area it seems like uh sales taxes even are ridiculously high here but um you know look across other parts of the state i mean in parts of the bay area or los angeles county sales taxes are as high as 10.75 percent um and of course those are areas that are dealing with a lot of the same issues that we are high cost of living um, and then high cost to provide services um, so you know, ultimately, this will be a question that the community decides. I'm supportive of putting it on the ballot today, um, but it'll be you know, up to our community to decide what they expect from county government. And um, you know, if this 
if voters don't approve this, then I mean, the reality is that we're not going to be able to show up as much as uh, we would like to. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm supportive of putting this measure on the ballot to begin with. I'd like to hear the public comment, of course, but for many reasons stated in the staff report, um, the, our county does not have the proper funding streams um, of the, to provide the level of services that we have uh, as we represent half of the population in this county. And we have a very low property tax rate, which compounds the situation for revenues for us, which is a big reason we have to ask voters for approval of message, uh, measures uh, in the uh, past, like GED and uh, and S uh, for library, public safety, for um for uh, roads, um, and I really want to thank the voters for doing that. We'd be in a bigger hole if we wouldn't have uh, approved those. And um, as mentioned, the county spent a great deal of funding to be proactively responsive to COVID and the CZU fire and the lightning complex fire, uh, the CZU fire and the atmospheric river uh, events that we had last winter. And we're expending a, a much larger federal share for that support, but it hasn't come. I mean, FEMA has run out of money and we, they, there's been disasters throughout this nation and certainly in this state that it is not giving us. And those are um, over a hundred million dollars total one way or the other that we, we've been paying for and uh, we're just hoping that they repay us. Um, and I think they will, but it's, they're not doing it now. And it really complicates the situation for us. Um, I think this this measure will help us provide the quality services that we want to do. Um, I, I think I know there's a question as why does do I, as you've mentioned why do all of Santa Cruz County voters, including the city voters, vote on our uh, sales tax measure of the county? Well, it's because we are the agents of the state to provide health care services, human services, and people pay into that, and that's part of our budget. So that's why everybody has to pay into that. And that's a legal requirement, as we've seen from past uh, cases. Um, and also, as you've mentioned, too, I want to make sure that the city of Santa Cruz voters realize that this is not going to be a half cent, half cent compound for a total of one cent. Uh, it'll only be a half cent for the incorporated area of the county and only a half cent for the city of Santa Cruz, should they both be approved. Um, I think those are very important uh issues and i i think respect um supervisor koenig's uh thoughts on inflation you know when uh, but the cost of inflation uh or inflation results in higher prices to build bridges or whatever the case may be um so uh, we're trying to keep up with it and inflation is at the highest point it's been in well uh sometime decade or more so uh that, that's really put a pinch on us. We're in a tight squeeze here in the county, and we're going to hear more about that next week. But um, if we don't have this uh, half-cent sales tax approved, we are not going to be able to provide the increasing uh, um, services that people want from this county. Uh, I think it's a responsible thing to do, and the voters will decide. But I think it's a legitimate request and uh, from some very, very uh, multiple uh, um, cases of of reasons why we need to go go for this but uh, i'm going to be supportive of this thank you supervisor mcpherson i'd like to open it up for the community is there anybody in chambers that would like to address this on specific to this item please step forward good morning again david schwartz um i'm opposed to this and i'll tell you why i'm opposed to this we have so many families in this county that are one paycheck away from homelessness. If we add this cost to their daily living, we may create more homelessness. And that's a big problem we have already. So we have to think about this. The other thing is we have opportunities for other sources of revenue that we might want to look at. One suggestion, let's put together a task force to look at the former redevelopment agency debt that's sucking up 22% of our property tax revenues. That's a much larger piece of the pie than we even get. And I don't know if that can be reallocated back to us and all the other uh, agencies within the, uh, the county or not, but it, I think it's worth looking into. One of the other things that I had mentioned earlier is uh, any opportunity for programs that we have to generate revenue 
and make themselves revenue neutral, which allow us to then re put that money to work in other areas. Um, finally, as you probably know, your county is actually a nonprofit as well. Why don't we ask the public to donate when they make their property tax at $100? They can actually deduct that as a charitable contribution. Now, I know we give a lot of money to charity, and we might be taking a little bit away from them, but people out there have money. Let's, let's ask them to help out as well without mandating it with a tax. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Uh, good morning. Uh, Ms. Ms. Coburn and uh, Mr. Heath both uh, talked to me a little bit uh, before this item came up, so I appreciate that. I don't think I learned anything new, though. Uh, my problem with this as the way it's framed is I don't think it's fair for the whole county to be voting on a tax in the unincorporated area. Um, I think most ordinary people could understand just the basic element of fairness. Um, but the way it's been described, uh, Santa Cruz city resident will be able to vote on the tax rate where I live, but I will not be able to vote on the uh, tax rate where that person lives. And I think uh, that sounds like an equal protection issue to me. Uh, both uh, Santa Cruz and Watsonville have district elections for city council, I believe because lawsuits were brought in the past uh, raising the equal protection issue under the US Constitution. But I don't think we even need to go there because the state uh, Revenue and Taxation Code has section 7285, and that has a fork. If you read the very first sentence, it's a big mouthful, but there's a fork in uh, section 7285. It says a county can either put on a tax that applies to the whole county and have the whole county vote, that's one prong, or the tax can be in the unincorporated area and the unincorporated area can vote on it. So. I don't see how this is consistent with uh, Section 7285. Also, I think the county can save about a quarter million dollars by not running this election in four cities. Uh, I looked at the Measure G results from five years ago, and the Measure G passed by a three to two margin in the unincorporated area. So I think this could still succeed even if you run it in the unincorporated in the unincorporated area. And my last point I'd like to make is I think this is going to make it more difficult to pass the Santa Cruz tax measure if Santa Cruz residents have both measures on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Thank you so much for allowing, allowing me to speak. My name is Tim Delaney. And uh, the last two gentlemen, uh, they brought up some very interesting points. You know, I, I kind of like, uh, I, I can't, I'm not sure if I should be totally supportive of uh, the sales tax. You know, the one thing I can say, though, you know, in speaking to some of my other relatives, including international relatives, they were mentioning stuff like, oh, you know, what state should I live in that doesn't have a state income tax or sales taxes and so on? And I pointed out to them that, well, those states, you know, they don't always have jobs and the economic conditions are not very good over there. So there's a reason why we have taxes over here in the state of California. Okay. Now, so even though I don't know all the ins and outs of uh, these type of measures and everything. I'd like to also point out to you, uh, just when I walked out of the room there, I talked to the Timber Fellows, and uh, they'd never seen an old growth Ponderosa forest. Or, and I'm not sure if they've even seen an old growth Redwood forest. So maybe you should be so quick to prove some of these sorts of things. So I have a challenge for all of you young, all of you young men, okay? Including Bruce. Uh, you should go down to Emerald Bay, Go all the way down there and stand there and take a look at those trees. There's only about 10 old growth Ponderosa trees left in the entire Tahoe Basin. And in the entire state of California, there's only about 1 to 3% old growth redwood left. And you can see that up in Northern California. You folks should take a trip to Tahoe and go down Emerald Bay and take a hard look at that and think about the environment and taxes and all these things that you do before you make any more decisions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you folks allowing me to speak. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers like to address us? Good afternoon, welcome back. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. 
why should we trust you now? When you came to the voters in 2018 with these very same arguments, support, and you didn't follow through with any of the fire support that you promised, you haven't followed through with the parks funding that you promised. Aptos Village Park was supposed to get $435,000. Now I'm told by the parks commissioner that was only a recommendation and there's no plan to do so. Why should we trust you now? The Santa Cruz County Grand Jury did a very good analysis of what happened and what has not happened. That was a 2021, did Measure G mislead voters? The Santa Cruz County Grand Jury said, yes, you did. And they urge in the front page, the, the title is Words Matter. For future revenue measures, the Grand Jury encourages the County Board of Supervisors to review this report and consider adopting a policy requiring county staff to provide clearer, more succinct language explaining the nature of each tax and how it may be spent. Simply saying, oh, yeah, we're going to give a million to this and a million to that, that is not clear or succinct or anything that lends trust to the taxpayer. Choir has received zero of Measure G funds, and yet here it is being touted out as the big cause for this. You have the ability to provide fire, county fire funding with reallocation of Prop 172 money. There's a half cent statewide sales tax that was passed just for that. May I have one more minute, please? About 30 seconds, please. Thank you. So you have the ability to reallocate that, and you, you do not. County fire gets zero of that money, but you have the ability to change that. You also have the ability to pursue re, uh, reconstitution of ERAF to get more of that money coming back from the state for fire and emergency services. You also took a very interesting stance to fire Rosemary Anderson, the county's emergency operations manager, as a cost cutting and instilled a whole new bloated department, the OR3, which has caused a lot of expense to the county. FEMA money may have dried up, but when these things happened, what happened in the county is that spending went crazy. Warehouses, renting in Monterey County to store equipment. I am asking you, when disasters come to be more prudent, for you. Thank you, Ms. Sunrunner. Thank you, Ms. Sunrunner. Thank you, Ms. Sunrunner. Thank you. We provided the additional time. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, sir. We're, is there anybody else in chambers that has not spoken to us at this item? Um, Madam Clerk, is there anybody <laughs> online? Yes, Chair. Call in user two. Your microphone's now available. Thank you, Becky, for that scathing reality factual check. Why should we trust you? I don't. I live in the unincorporated area and play, pay plenty of taxes. And what they're going for, the taxes are very disturbing for me. And of course, the overall tax and equitable system in the whole country, it, we're part of it where the wealthy and the corporations don't pay and our tax money goes for Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and other military production corporations to kill people all over the world. What um, We need the money to go for beneficial projects in our own communities. You talk about providing for the public health and safety, all this radar, wireless technology, murder towers, cell towers, they call them murder towers, when you know how dangerous it is. What um, assault 
on the public health and safety. And here are just quick facts till you cut me off. Cell phones, cell towers, Wi-Fi, wireless, smart meters, emit microwave, radio frequency, radiation, and children are especially vulnerable. Independent research shows this radiation causes cellular stress and damage, DNA damage, blood-brain barrier disrupted, increased cancer and tumor risk, decreased melatonin, insomnia, abnormal heart rhythm, strokes, altered brain waves, cognitive difficulties, memory and concentration, headaches, links to Alzheimer's and impacts to wildlife. Stop squandering our money on assault weapons. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Guerin. Is there anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board. Supervisor Cumming. Yeah, I just want to thank um, city staff for their work on this and for highlighting all the great work that the county does. And I do also want to thank members of the public who spoke today. And I just want to highlight, too, that this is, you know, not, it's not as if we're being fiscally irresponsible here. Um, the county has done a great job at um, managing the public's money well. What's happening is that over time, costs are going up, the cost to provide services are going up, and we're expanding the services that we can provide here in the county. And in order to pay for all that, we have to find a revenue source. And the sales tax revenue um, can greatly help us as we do that. Um, we've been very responsive after the storms where crews were out fixing roads and clearing roads as quickly as they could to get people moving around again. Uh, the county was responsive with getting the OR3 office up and running, which has been really helpful at helping to address issues around disasters and how we can be more responsive to disasters. Um, as was pointed out earlier, they've helped with getting funding for the Powell Road Levy, Watson Mill Hospital, and helping us move forward with how we can address equity within our county. And so, you know, I think that the county has been really demonstrating to the public that we want to do the best we can to use our money um, the most effectively as we can. Um, but what we're going to the people saying now is that in order to provide better services and in order to continue to serve you, you know, we need to raise some more money. Um, we need to make sure that our workers have a place to live and that they'll stay, that we can retain them so they're not going over the hill because they can get paid more. Um, and, you know, in order for us to continue to operate these services and have a functioning county, we need revenue. And we're hoping that, you know, we can get the voters to support us as we're moving forward with this. And so, um, I'm very supportive of this tax measure. I also want to point out that this is something that doesn't just fall on the, on the backs of the residents. We, we heard a lot about how Santa Cruz is very open to having visitors come from other areas. And when those people from outside of our community come to our community and they spend money, that money comes back to us in the form of sales tax dollars. So I think, you know, it's different than like a property tax where the individual who lives here is just solely paying that. This is a revenue measure that, that, that yes, people who live here will have to pay into, but all the other visitors who show up here will also be paying into this as well. So I think we should just keep that in mind as we're moving forward with, you know, asking the, the community to support us on this because people always ask, how can we get more money from people who are coming into our community? Increasing our sales tax is one way we can do that. And so um, I just want to encourage our county electeds, members of the community and community groups to help, to help us as we move forward in this endeavor so that we can continue to provide um, good services and keep really talented workers here in our community. And so I'm happy with that. I'm happy to move the staff recommendation. I'll second. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. Any additional comments appears no. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? And friend. All right. And that passes unanimously. Um, council, we're going to be moving into closed session. Do you anticipate anything to be reportable out of closed session? No. All right. Well, then that'll close the open portion of the meeting. The board will move into our closed session.